context of white supremacy, Gus T. Renegade, and justice in for another edition of The Cows, hopefully to provide constructive information on racism, white supremacy, what it is, and how it works. Um, quite strange to be sitting here for this particular program. This is program number 50 for The Cows, broadcast from Blog Talk Radio. Um, kind of wild to think 50 programs have been done. Um, I'm using the phone. At any rate, just had a uh, suspected uh, white person come in and uh, disrupt me using the telephone system of racism, white supremacy. At any, and on the 50th program, as I said, been rather uh, rather wild to be doing 50 shows at this point. Um, today's guest, uh, Mr. Uh, Rich Benjamin, he is author of uh, Searching for Whitopia, very interesting book. Uh, basically goes out to these different white areas uh, to talk to white people uh, who live in areas that are exclusively and or predominantly white. Okay, uh, He uh, spends a lot of time there. And this is across the country. This is not just one particular area. goes to uh, Utah, um, New York, uh, just bunches of different areas to talk to different white people about why they're living in these particular areas, uh, how they feel about non-white people, uh, what's you know driving white people to do uh, to look for these particular areas uh, to reside in. Very interesting work. Uh, was, this book was actually suggested by one of my listeners. Uh, she's in the chat room right now, Miss Lauren Ashley. Um, so very interested. Uh, we're very pleased to have him, and I believe he is with us now. Uh, Mr. Benjamin, is that you? That's me. Hello. Outstanding. Glad to have you with us, sir. I'm glad to be here. Outstanding. Do you think you could share with uh, our listeners here uh, any information you think would be helpful so they have a better understanding of who Rich Benjamin is and uh, why you put this book together? Okay. Well, I am a writer based out of New York City who grew up in a predominantly white suburb, and I just published a book called Searching for Whitopia, An Improbable Journey to the Heart of White America. And for two years, I embarked a 27,000-mile journey to the widest, fastest-growing communities in our country to see what makes them tick. And for me, what inspired the journey is reading a headline one day that said, by 2042, white people will no longer be the majority in America. And so that fascinated me. Hmm. Very interesting. We're going to hop into the book to uh, get more details about this journey that he took across the country to uh, investigate whitopia. Um, before we go forward, I just wanted to clarify for our listeners who might not be familiar with your book or haven't seen a picture of you, you are a non-white male, is that correct? I'm black, yes. <laughs> okay, just, just yeah, clarifying. I'm yes. Very important. Um, my co-host, she is a non-white female. She is all of 10 years old. She also very interested in racism, and uh, she also interested in asking questions. Uh, Justice, do you have any questions you would like to ask uh, Mr. Benjamin? Can everyone on the call be a, at a vocabulary, a vocabulary level that I can understand? Thank you. Well, you sound like you have a good vocabulary, so I think you'd understand most of the book. It's a fun book. It's a travel journey. And I think readers can go on the ride. I visit St. George, Utah, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, and Forsyth County, Georgia. So definitely, I think with... Uh, smart uh, middle school vocabulary you can enjoy the book towards the conclusion I suggest some things we can do as America to combat the problems I've talked about so that part might be a little hard for you but most of the book no okay how can the system of white supremacy be stopped? 
boy, <laughs> what what grade are you in, Justice? Fifth. Fifth. Okay. Oh my goodness. Well, I don't I don't identify a system of white supremacy, and I don't call it such. What I what I do talk about is segregation. So I don't know if if we talking if our words are interchangeable. How do you what do you mean by white supremacy? What I mean by is people who are getting mistreated by white people and they're not getting the help that they need. That's I what see. I mean by white supremacy. I see. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, what and, and what other questions do you have? Oh, um how do you work to produce justice? How do I work to produce justice? First of all, I de- I in I identify injustice. So first you have to know what you're fighting against. How do we define injustice in this country? Economic in- hello? Oh, we can hear you. Yes, sir. Yeah, economic injustice or racial injustice, global injustice, first problem is to identifying it really well as sources, as causes, as problems. The, sec- hello? the second uh, way is once you've identified it, is to get solutions to the problems. And it depends what you mean by injustice. The, the injustice I talk about, hello? We can hear you. The ones I talk about, it's it's a question of zoning. How do you it, combat unfair zoning, exclusionary zoning? Oh, are you uh, with us? Hello? Are you with us? Hello? I'm sorry, I, I, I can't hear you anymore. Hello? Oh, Hello? We, I, we can hear you. Can you hear oh, us? Now I can hear you. Okay. Can you hear me? Now I can hear you. Thank you. Exclusionary zoning, a lack of affordable housing. The book identifies ways <coughs> to combat them and to press local governments to improve the matter. Okay. Thank you. That's all for now. Okie You're welcome. Um... Very interesting. Um, I wanted to uh, first get, because your book, you do talk a lot about racism. Could you share what you mean when you say racism with our listeners? Yes. Two things. First, I talk about interpersonal racism, and that's the dynamic between two human beings. I say interpersonal racism has gone down significantly since my parents' generation in the 1960s. The second type of racism I identify is structural racism, and that's the policies of institutions and markets that keep the races separate and unequal. And so that's the type of racism I focus on, is structural racism. And that has a broad definition. Uh, Again, if, if you're an outer, outer suburban community and you forbid public transportation, from coming into your community because you're complaining about crime and you're worried about the influx of urban people, that's the structural racism because then the urban people lack a means to good jobs, a means to get to good jobs. And we see this in Texas, we see this in Atlanta, we see this after Hurricane Katrina, is that the lack of mass transport has been a big problem and it's a big part of why this country remains segregated. Okay, I just, uh, my program, we like to be very clear about terms uh, mm. because I have seen that is a huge stumbling block in discussions of racism, and I'm not quite sure I got a definition for what you mean when you say racism. You said interpersonal racism and structural racism, but I, I don't think I, I ever quite got a specific explanation of what you mean when you use the term racism. Well, that's right. So I don't use the term racism by itself. I use it qualified twice. 
The first is interpersonal racism, and that's when people view race as a way of separating people in one-to-one relationships, interpersonal racism. The second way I use it is structural racism, when structural forces, i.e. market policies, business behaviors, organizational behaviors, keep the races separate and unequal. So two definitions, interpersonal racism and structural racism. Okay. Um, We're going to come back to that in the program. Um, But this particular program, The Cows, Context of White Supremacy, uh, I have unfortunately concluded that we are in a global system of racism, white supremacy, and the definition that I use for both racism and white supremacy is a global system of people who classify themselves as white Mm -hmm. and are dedicated to abusing and or subjugating everyone in the known universe whom they classify as not white. Uh, Do you believe that such a system exists, and do you think that definition is accurate? I think it exists. I wouldn't agree with that definition, because then you get into an example of when what happens when Latinos are oppressing Latinos or Asians are oppressing Asians. I mean, what kind of supremacy is that? And so part of what this book does is to put aside old definitions and old thinking and say, how are people not getting ahead? And so is there a global system of white supremacy? What happens with supremacy when there are no whites around? Or frankly, in this country, what happens when you have people of color oppressing other people of color? For example, if, if, if you view the war in Iraq as supremacy and oppression, the Secretary of State was black. So I think my view of supremacy is a little more nuanced, and it's not just always white people uh, oppressing others. Okay. Um, I want to point this out for our listeners. I think this is very important. This program, I've had mostly white guests on the show. I think I've had about two white guests for every one non-white guest. Uh, Every white person that's been on this program has agreed that we are in a system of white supremacy and that that definition is correct except for four and one of those, former imperial wizard of the Ku Klux Klan. Non-white guests, we're running, I think, a little below 50%. We're about mm-hmm. less than half of the non-white guests who've been on the show believe that we're in a system of white supremacy and or they do not think that definition is correct. I think that's very uh, important to keep that in mind for the listeners. Uh, and I also want to point out that I believe you can have a system of white supremacy, or let me correct that, I believe we do have a system of white supremacy where you have non-white people mistreating other non-white people all the time. That is one of the key aspects of the system of white supremacy that maintains this system, the non-white people mistreating other non-white people and focusing on each other as opposed to focusing on the white people who maintain, expand, and refine the system of white supremacy. Um, But... Mr. Benjamin, I wanted to uh, – I, I just think this is very, very fascinating. Uh, what prompted you, non-white male, uh, to say, I want to go out and uh, explore these white air, white-topias, white you call them. What prompted you to go out and investigate these areas across the country? There is a big literature of white scholars and white experts who go to the inner city and they – talk about the ghetto, and I'm sure you're familiar with that literature. It's from Daniel Patrick Moynihan on, and they talk about the culture of poverty. I did not want to do the reverse, where I talk about white culture or mainstream culture without visiting it myself. And so in order to do so, I had to embed myself in these communities, and so I did. Very interesting. Um, In uh, reading your book here... um, you talk a lot, at least, and you can please correct me if I have misread something in your work. Uh, in your book, you talk a lot about how you don't necessarily believe that the white people who go out to these areas, you don't necessarily believe that they are racist. 
um, you do think um, there is a strong connection between the appeal that these areas have for the white people who live there and the fact that these communities are exclusively or overwhelmingly white, but you don't necessarily think that these areas are race, uh, the people, the white people in these areas are racist. Um, do you feel like these, uh, these white enclaves, these white topias, do you feel like uh, that just these areas in and of themselves, that that is an act of racism, white supremacy? The, their mere existence, is that an act of white supremacy? Yes, sir. No, I don't believe that. Okay. Why do you, why do you think that that is not, that their existence is not an act of white supremacy, racism? Well, I heard uh, Justice's definition of supremacy. What's your definition of supremacy? Mine, again, a global system of people. Are you saying racism, my definition of racism? Both, and supremacy. Okay. My definition for racism and white supremacy, a global system of people who classify themselves as white and are dedicated to abusing and or subjugating everyone in the known universe who they classify as not white. Okay. I'm if I mean, if that's your definition, then you can make an argument that people are subjugated by the Whitopia communities, but I don't think it subjugates people. Nowhere in the book do I say that. I forgot um, one thing of my definition of white supremacy. Let's hear it. Yes. <laughs> um, it's a strong belief. Um, but I forgot. A strong belief system? Yes. Okay. Very strong. Okay. Okay. I'm I'm just I'm curious and I, I'm sure our listeners want to uh know as well. You said you do not think that these areas are acts of racism. Um could you share more of, of why you feel these areas are not acts of racism? Oh, you asked me if I thought the people in the community are racist. No, 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 no. Didn't didn't ask that. What I said was just the existence of these white areas. Do you feel that that is an act of racism, white supremacy? And you said you do not think that the mere existence of these areas is an act of racism. And I was hoping that you could uh, just clarify your viewpoint on that for our listeners. I think I asked people, well, why are you in these communities? And they gave me all sorts of reasons why I'm in the communities. In the minority of instances, they said, yes, I prefer a community that's socially, racially, and economically homogenous, i.e., where I'm comfortable with people who feel and look the way I do. Many people move to these communities without giving race a second thought, and therefore, there is no overt or explicit race-based intention as to why they're there. And therefore, it doesn't fit under my definition of racism. Now, people have different definitions of racism. People like the word supremacy. That's been floating around for some time. And so they're free to categorize these communities as supremacist or racist or however they want. But that, listening carefully to what people actually said, I wouldn't brush stroke these communities as an act of racism, no. Okay. I do find that interesting because I, I do think in your book, uh, and please correct me if I have misinterpreted something, uh, that you pointed out that you, you feel it is inseparable, uh, the draw that these, community, these communities have across the country uh, is inseparable from the fact that they are predominantly white. The white people who are moving here, um, that is at the core of why they're coming to these areas, the fact that they are, uh, as you pointed out, so uh, homogenous and that you don't really have a lot of non-white people. You do have over an overwhelming number of white people in these areas, unless I'm misinterpreting you. Yes. The qualities that attract people to these communities, in many or most Americans' minds, become interchangeable with whiteness. So in other words, if and sociologists have proven this, if you take the average home buyer consumer and you say high property value, natural amenity, safety, good schools, in the back of their head, consciously or subconsciously, they will associate that community with whiteness. However, that's not necessarily the same as saying that there is a race-based act of intentional malice against another race 
that mere association. And so I think that's where our ideas and our differences depart. Oh, and I, I just want to clarify for our listeners, uh, I completely agree. I do not think that just because you are a racist white supremacist means that you have hatred for non-white people. I for sure believe that you have a ton of Atticus Finch racists. Uh, Atticus Finch, those who don't know, uh, kill a, uh, To Kill a Mockingbird. Uh, he is one of the most beloved characters in film history. Uh, everyone loves Atticus Finch, nicest guy in the world, uh, and he is a lawyer for a non-white male who is, of course, falsely accused of raping a white woman. Atticus Finch has a non-white servant taking care of his kids, a mammy, if you will, taking care of his kids and whatnot. Do I think Atticus Finch is a racist? For sure. Do I think he has hatred for non-white people? He didn't demonstrate any. doesn't seem like he has hatred for non-white people, but it for sure looks like he is subjugating non-white people for his benefit. I think he fits the bill for a racist, would love anybody to come challenge me and tell me that he's not. Uh, I don't think white people have to have dislike or hatred for non-white people to practice racism, white supremacy. Very, very important to uh, clarify that for our listeners because I don't, I don't believe that that is the case at all. I think you can have tons of white people who are racist and very nice to the non-white people that they dominate. Tons of nice slave masters. Um, in your book on page uh, 185, Mr. Benjamin, you said that uh, contrary to popular belief, discrimination or segregation do not require animus. Mm. They thrive even in the absence of prejudice or ill will. It's common to have racism without racists. Could you break that down for our listeners, please? Yes. Once again, you lack the racist because you lack the interpersonal animus from one human being to another. But you do have structural racism, i.e. the business forces, the government policies, the widespread decisions that keep the races separate and unequal. So it's common to have racism without racists, meaning that interpersonally people are not racist, but you have structural racism. common to have racism without racists. You said uh, business forces and government policies um, would, at the end of the day, would it be people who are responsible for the business forces and government policies that bring about uh, racist results? People institute them, yes. Okay. Would, it be, would we be talking about white people? who institute these business forces and government policies? Yeah. Okay. In many cases. But, okay. But they would not be racist if they are white people who are instituting business forces and government policies that bring about a racist result. They would not be racist. Absolutely. In the way I define interpersonal racism and structural racism, absolutely. One of uh, – there's a chat room attached to the program for people, if you're listening uh, – if you're listening archived or live, there is a chat room attached with the show. One of the uh, listeners in the chat room uh, asked, how can you have racism without racism? Okay. Is, 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 is my distinction between interpersonal racism and structural racism not clear to her or him? Uh, I don't know if it's her or him. Um, it seems it would seem no it's not clear that yet yeah, because now someone else has said the same thing it's not clear to them either so i guess the answer How, i guess would be no okay on any given day if you define interpersonal racism as an animus between two human beings any number of government officials will not have this animus directed against another human being in other words they are delighted if one a uh, black family or Latino family or Asian family moves in this neighborhood. They have friends. They may even have a spouse of a different race. Therefore, there is a lack of interpersonal racism. However, that individual is complicit, directly or indirectly, in a system 
that maintain segregation. And so uh, we see tons of examples of this. And we'll, we'll see even people of color in power who may not be interpersonally racist against any races, but they are complicit in a system that keeps races separate and unequal. So personally, having done the on-the-ground research, to me that's not such a contradiction. But, you know, for some people it is, and I accept that. I think I, I concede race causes a lot of cognitive dissonance in people. In other words, some people behave in this way, and some things work well in this way, but they don't work well in other ways. And so people are confused or people are doubtful when you have a paradox or a contradiction. And I concede there can be racism without racist. It's a contradiction. It's a paradox. But it's not irreconcilable. Hmm. I hope uh, that's a little clearer for the folks in the chat room. Um, Justice, did you have some questions that you would like to ask Mr. Benjamin? How do you think you would feel once the system of white supremacy is eliminated? Pardon me, I didn't, I didn't quite hear your question. How would I feel if? How do you think you would feel once the system of white supremacy is eliminated? Yeah, we, we, just, we just had a, a discussion where I, I didn't accept the premise of the host that said we are in a global system of white supremacy. So I, I, don't, I don't accept the premise of the question. Well, uh, I didn't want to interrupt. I just wanted to clarify. I thought you did not agree with the definition, but you did think we were in a system of racism, white supremacy. No, I said it can exist. I didn't say we were under a system of white supremacy. Okay. Thank you for clarifying. To me, you said, uh, it was earlier, you said that you do not think that there is a system of white supremacy. Uh, you said that to me. And I said we do. But I, you may believe you live under a system of white supremacy. I do not believe I live under a system of white supremacy. Okay. And that'll be all for now. Doki. Again, this is Mr. Rich Benjamin. He is the author of Searching for Whitopia. Very interesting book. Just came out this year. Um, I'm just I'm curious because I read your book and uh, there are just tons of anecdotes where uh, you went and you actually lived in these areas for a significant amount of time. Uh, and anecdotes where uh, I don't know, you, you went to uh, with your a real estate agent to uh, check out a house in one particular area, I believe it's Dixie, Utah, and they had a Sambo figure in the yard. Uh, you were in a different area, and uh, the white people were upset about uh, so-called uh, illegal immigrants coming into the country, and during their demonstration, they wanted T-shirts that had H2O on the back of the shirt uh, to symbolize wetback, yeah. uh, a racial slur for uh, so-called Latinos, uh, non-white people. Um, you were speaking with, uh, I believe, a white person uh, named Randy, and he asked you how or, or how or what are we calling you all right now, referencing non-white people, I guess specifically black people. What, what is the politically correct racial title for black people at this point? And uh, he said that he didn't know and that he normally just says nigger. Um, just a ton of these types of anecdotes uh, throughout your, your investigation for doing this book, um, you, you don't think uh, that that qualifies any of these people for being racist? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and these people are participants in both interpersonal racism and structural racism. Hmm. Very interesting. Very, I just some of the anecdotes, uh, and I'm leaving out some of them. I'll share one more colorful one. When you were with the, uh, you went to a lot of churches uh, in these areas, and yes. uh, 
in one of the churches, you were sitting next to a white woman, and I guess the pastor, uh, or matter of fact, it would be better coming from you because you were there. I, I suspect you know where I, which incident I'm talking about. If you could share that with our listeners, because I thought that was hilarious. Yes, uh, I was sitting. I I visited a white separatist religious sect in North Idaho, and one of the pastors of this white separatist religious outpost said, turn to your neighbor and put your arm around them in brotherhood. And the woman next to me cut me a look that said, don't you dare. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, I'm sorry for laughing. That that probably no, is not please. funny. Um, I, I laugh too. There's a lot of dark comedy in this book. And this is what I'm talking about when I talk about cognitive dissonance. Is that there is there's a lot of dark comedy of sort of racism and mean spiritedness and some people are touched by the kindness you know whether it's the dinner parties or people sending me home with pork chop doggy bags and banana nut bread and so it's typical for example we think of Mark Furman who says but I'm not a racist I have a black girlfriend and in his mind he believes he's not a racist but this is the sort of cognitive dissonance that exists across the political spectrum and race. Take on the liberal side, for example, we've just elected a black president, and then many liberals do not know what that means for the country. It doesn't, they don't know what it means for their beliefs. Like, what is the state of race relations now that we've elected a black president? It may not be anything. It may, not, it may be a whole lot. But in any event, it's sort of creating a bunch of contradictions and tensions and unresolved confusion. And this is what I mean when we have uh, contradictions and cognitive dissonances. And so I laughed at those, every one of those anecdotes you told me was funny at the time. But segregation itself is not funny. So talk about cognitive dissonance. Mm. Wow. I'm, I'm just curious because I'm, I'm sure our listeners, um, <clears throat> could you share a little bit more about this, uh, this separatist, white separatist church in Idaho? Because I, I know uh, when I was reading the book, one of the members, unless I'm, I'm uh, remembering incorrectly, he, he said uh, uh, God is, is, is uh, God loves all the races. Everybody's fine. He doesn't dislike any races. But, and he made a point of letting you know, white people are the apple of God's eye. Uh, could you share a little bit more just about what you observed and what your thoughts were about this white separatist church that you went to? Yes, 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 yes. And it's funny because you asked me about the definition of white supremacy. Mm. So as I said, I went to this three-day separatist retreat. It was three days of sermons and lectures and coffee breaks where we sat on the porch. And then there was a picnic lunch each of those three days. And so the fellow you're referring to, he just wanted to clarify. He said, our religious belief says that the races should be separate, but the races are not supreme. And so he said, I just want to be away from you. I don't think I'm better than you. Yes, I was laughing too. <laughs> yeah, I was. And so, it's, it's, supremacy is tricky. And so, part of, I think, my resistance to your definition of supremacy is that, in my mind at least, it really chimes this old-fashioned idea of the Klan in the 1950s. And so, while I don't want to soft-pedal racism, I become resistant to the language of when supremacy was even worse. And so I'm reminded of this gentleman who tells me we're not supremacists, we're separatists. Hmm. Hmm. And I just wanted to be, be sure, was that the same gentleman who said uh, white people are the apple of God's eye? It's the same man. Okay. It's the same okay. man. Did, I'm just, did he clarify what he meant when he said white people are the apple of God's eye? Yes, what he meant by that is they are the chosen. In other words, some strands of Christianity believe that there are chosen races, that there are races who will have different and better afterlives. And he believes that, not white people, he says Anglo-Saxons, because Jews are white. But he says Anglo-Saxons are the apple of God's eye. And he thinks that Anglo-Saxons and not the Israelites or not the Muslims, as Muslims believe. He believes Anglo-Saxons are the chosen. Hmm. Wow. Wow. That, 
Why, one of the people in the chat room just wanted to clarify, so that means these people think that God has got to be a white person. Do you think that's accurate? I think so, and I think they think God is Anglo-Saxon, not just white. Okay, okay, okay. Wow. Wow. <laughs> very, very interesting. Again, Mr. Rich Benjamin, author of Searching for Whitopia, and all these anecdotes. I mean, this is in the book. If you get the book, all this stuff is in the book. Um Justice, did you have a question you would like to ask Mr. Benjamin? Yes. How do you how do you know that God is a white person? I don't think God is a white person. I thought I thought you said that God is a white person. No, I was stating uh this religious church's belief. These church believes that God is an Anglo Saxon. Okay. Thank you. Um, You're welcome. That'll be all for now. Okie dokie. Um, I thought this was very interesting. You were talking about, and again, for everybody listening, he went, Mr. Benjamin. Uh, went across the country uh, doing uh, his investigation. He was, uh, and he we already talked about uh, Utah, Idaho, Georgia, uh, New York, just tons of places across the country to uh, do this book. Um, you were talking about your experience when you were in uh, New York, and uh, on page uh, 181 uh, in your book, <clears throat> excuse me, you said that uh, my unscientific, though careful experiment leads me to this necessary conclusion. Race is not a decisive obstacle to acquiring certain co-ops. And this was, you uh, went around in New York, and you did this in various places, but just trying to see if you could uh, secure uh, a living space, uh, in this particular instance, uh, one of the uh, co-ops that you were visiting uh, in New York, just going out and checking different co-ops to see if, uh, hey, they would they would be acceptable to having a black person living in one of these spaces. Um, why did you come to that conclusion uh, that race really is not a, a big obstacle for, for getting uh, certain co-ops? Because those co-ops in question, if I were ready to buy, I would have been able to buy them as a black person. Mm. Hmm. And again, that doesn't mean every black person would be able to, mm. but because I would be, race is not always indeed a decisive factor and being denied real estate. Mm. Wow. Um, I, found it, uh, I found it interesting because that was page 181. On the next page, um, you said that beyond money, these co-ops demand particular social networks and the right life track, which effectively shutters them to non whites. Um, that to me seems like race is a big factor. And even if it's not an explicit group of white people sitting around saying, you know, we're going to make sure that Rich Benjamin and uh, no other non-white person gets to live in our spot, just the fact that, as you stated, you need these uh, this network. You need connections yeah. to be able to get in these certain spots. And these connections generally tend to be pristine white. Uh, just being a non-white person is going to uh, knock you out of the running for having the right access to people and clubs and life track to get access to living in these co-ops. It would seem that race is a major obstacle to being able to live there. Indeed, it's a major obstacle. It's not a decisive obstacle. In other words, it's a big hindrance but it's it it's not the do you understand the difference? It's a big hindrance, it's a major obstacle, but it's not the decisive obstacle. Hmm. Hmm. It seems uh it seems like a quite a formidable obstacle. I, I don't know if I would say decisive or I guess I would ask, well what do you mean when you say decisive? Decisive means a, a deal breaker. Under okay. no circumstances that by itself and in and of itself will not allow someone to purchase real estate. So let's just take an example to make this more concrete. 
Uh, let's take Kofi Annan, the former Secretary General of the United Nations, who is black. He has the right life track, and he could get into these co-ops under question. However, I don't believe Kofi Annan has the money. I mean, I don't think Kofi Annan is worth forty, fifty, sixty million dollars, which is the money we're talking about. Mm. Flip the script. Let's take uh, Jay Z. Jay Z does have the money, but then Jay Z doesn't have the life track, and so it's a combination of the life track and the race. In other words, there are black people with the life track and the social connections and the right schools and the right summer homes and the right winter homes to have access to this. But as I said, the majority of of non-whites get shuttered out effectively by this policy. Hmm. Wow. I don't know if I would say decisive, but it certainly seems like if you are a non-white person, uh, just being non-white is going to have a severe and significant adverse impact on the likelihood of you being able to secure one of these living, uh, living areas. Do you think that's an accurate statement? Yes, I think that's very fair. Okay. Okay. Um, I know uh, towards the close of the book you talked about – oh, I want to make sure I got uh, called. I'll give them the number in a second. Uh, towards the close of your work, you talked about the importance of working – to working for integration. Um, that's another word I think it's very important to have a definition. Could you share with us what your definition of integration is? I believe most sociologists' definition, and that means the amount of contact one race has with other races in their day-to-day -day life. So that means residentially, that means in schools, that means in public spaces like libraries and parks. Integration means integrated contact among races in day-to-day -day life. And so it doesn't just mean diversity where we say, oh, we're a rainbow flavor and there are many types of people. But if there's no meaningful contact, then you don't have integration. Hmm. What, uh, what is meaningful contact, just so I, we can be clear? Meaningful contact in volume and substance meaning frequency and substance. And so it's not superficial contact in terms of browsing or brushing shoulders on a train. That's not meaningful. Okay. Meaningful would be, uh, could, you, could we have some examples of meaningful contact? Meaningful contact means sharing a classroom. It means sharing a library. It means sharing a grocery store. And it means sharing a street block. It means sharing resources and regular contact. That's not just, you know, passing flash in the pan. Okay. okay. Much clearer understanding. Okay. Um, I, uh, I'm just curious, what, uh, how do you think integration will solve the problem of racism, having this meaningful contact between white people and non-white people? I don't know that, well, first of all, integration is often the proof that you solved a lot of structural racism. Not all, but some. And so integration, in many ways, had we had integration, I would submit that we would have less structural racism. In other words, look, 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 at, look at what happened in New Orleans. Both the fact that the hurricane happened and the aftermath of the hurricane. So not only were folks denied transport out of the city, were they made to sweat and literally die in the Superdome. Once the disaster was over, how was it handled? It was bungled yet again. That is what I mean when I talk about institutions and policies and even private businesses keeping the races separate and unequal. So had we not had Hurricane Katrina, that would be some indication that we're making gains against structural racism. Mm. Hmm. I'm just I'm curious because I feel uh, I don't use the term integration um, when I talk about racism, white supremacy, because yeah. um, I feel like uh, you said it seemed like a, a core part of integration is having meaningful contact between white people and non-white people, not just where they uh, bump into each other on the street, but where they actually right. are. 
uh, right. in the library together, in a classroom together, uh, sure. shopping together, that type of thing. Sure. Uh, I feel like if that's meaningful contact, uh, then a slave plantation, it could be said that that is meaningful contact because you've got the slave and the slave master. They're, having, they're in the kitchen together. Sometimes they're having sexual intercourse together. They're, they're having a lot of meaningful contact. They could be reading together. Uh, that could be said to be integrated. Um, you could, at least for, for my understanding, there are many periods during the history of racism, white supremacy, where white people and non-white people have had a lot of contact with each other, meaningful contact, where right. they've been in the same classroom and ate together, slept together, been married, but you still had clear white domination of non-white people. I'm sorry, implied in my definition of meaningful is equal and equitable. So, of course, a slave house or a plantation isn't meaningful because mm -hmm. no one's believing that this is equitable. Mm -hmm. So, in addition to sustained, in addition to frequent, in addition to substantial and substantive, you should add equitable. Okay. okay. To meaningful. Okay. Okie dokie. I, I, that makes more sense. Okay. Um, yeah, because that's, that's uh, I guess as a non-white person, um, I'm not really, uh, I don't know, people can get upset if they need to. I'm not really that interested in uh, living next to white people. I just don't want to be mistreated if uh, Randy or any other of the, uh, the white separatist folks at the church in Idaho or anywhere else, if they don't want to live next to me, that's fine. I just don't want to be mistreated. I just don't want my quality of life to be reduced because I'm a non-white person and I don't get the privilege of living next to these white people. That's That could be perfectly fine. We don't have to see each other. We don't have to hang out. We don't have to go to the library together. Just we should both have equal access to excellent quality of life. That is the problem that I think uh, the system of white supremacy creates is that it has an extraordinarily devastating impact on your quality of life if you are a non-white person. And I don't think that will be corrected by just living next to a white person or having a lot of contact with a white person. Uh, there would have to be work that specifically addresses replacing white supremacy with justice so that non-white people have uh, just the same access to excellent quality of life, resources, etc., as white people, and I don't think that's the case, and I just haven't seen any evidence where having so-called integration makes that the case either. But So you believe, you, you believe separate could be equal? In other words, as long as you have your separate schools, you take it on faith that they would be equal? No, I believe you could have a system of justice where no one is mistreated and people who need help get the help that they need. I believe you could have that, and you could have non-white people and white people not hanging out not living together, not being in the same classroom. Yes, I think that is possible. I'm not saying it has to be that way, but if, you know, white people really feel like, hey, we just don't want to be around you guys, no problem. As long as we can have a system of justice, no problem. My fear is that because of the way federal resources work, that if we did in fact have separate schools for the races, separate libraries for the races, separate parks for the races because at present there is corporations and business interest and the same interests that have had the lion's share of political power for the last 50 years will never have separate and equal. In other words, we can't say I want, resources, uh, I want equal resources and I don't care about integration because if we do have separate resources, they'll never be equal. That's my opinion. But... Mm. But yeah. Anyway, yeah, I, it's a been a, yeah. I feel that that's completely valid. I, I totally understand what you're saying, and that's why uh, I don't say I want separation from white right. people. I just say I don't want the system of white supremacy. Replace white supremacy with justice, and then we can see after we have that. If we want to hang out together, that's fine. If we don't want to hang out together, that's fine too. But long as no one's mistreated. That's what we want to have, at least for me, that's what I want to be the centerpiece. No mistreatment. Then, hey, if we don't want to hang out, no problem, no mistreatment. If we want to hang out, fine, no mistreatment. That should be the core of it. Um, 
justice. Yeah. Oh, and hey, I keep saying, people, if you want to call in to uh, ask uh, yeah. Mr. Benjamin a uh, question or two. I appreciate uh, that note, but at 4.50, I have to catch a flight. Oh, okay. What time is it now, 50, sir? It's, it's 4.50. Oh, darn. Okay. Well, yeah. uh, we appreciate you uh, coming to hang out. I enjoyed the book. Darn. Uh, is, is there anything you would like to say as we uh, close out the program? No, just to thank you and Justice, of course, for uh, your your hospitality and having me on this program. No doubt. I, I hope the uh, book continues to sell well and uh, have a safe and enjoyable flight, sir. Thank you. No problem, Mr. Rich Benjamin. Uh, we are going to take a uh, quick commercial break, and then we will be right back. Context of White Supremacy, Justice, and Gus T. Renegade. Okay. Is racism hurting you? On issues of race, are you unable to speak, think, and act with clarity and confidence? Are you tired of laughing when nothing is funny, smiling when you are not happy, agreeing when you really disagree? Counterracism.com, you can learn specific strategies and techniques to counter the behaviors of the people who practice racism in all areas of activity. Using words correctly, following counter-racist logic, even counter-racist science projects designed to reveal what racism is, how it works, and how to counter it. The open source code writing format allows you to pick and choose from a variety of counter-racist suggestions so you can produce the code that works for you. Stop by counterracism.com today and help replace racism with justice. That's counter-racism.com. The cows, justice, gusty renegade. Man, I uh, was hoping we were going to get five more minutes. Uh, I was, I saw the question in the chat room. I wanted to get that one. I was either hoping someone was going to call or I was going to ask myself. I thought we at least had five more minutes. Um, Darn, my fault. I was I was hoping to get to the sex question as well. I think that would have been very interesting to uh, see his answer on that. Um, darn, that would have been uh, man. Should have asked. Should have asked. My fault, gang. My fault, gang. I was how very was interested. It, how was it uh, your fault? Uh, because I saw someone in the chat room asked uh, earlier in the program if uh, Mr. Benjamin, uh, if he was having sexual intercourse with a white person. And uh, I could have asked that question earlier in the show, but uh, I thought we had more time than we did, and so I was waiting to ask it until a little later in the program, and uh, I didn't ask. So I would I would say I am most to blame for that question not getting asked. Oh, um, I also had a question, but um, I I didn't really. Uh, he, he had to go. What was your question? It was, what suggestions can you offer to help eliminate racism and white supremacy? Hmm. That would have been interesting. I'm, I'm, I, would, I think he would have had, uh, I think he would have had some interesting ideas, particularly based on what he saw with uh, all these white people. Oh yeah, people in the mm-hmm. chat room. Yes, you can still call in. Uh, the number, if you would like to call in, is three four seven. Two one five six zero seven one. Yes, if you would like to call in to share a thought on what you heard uh, from Mr. Benjamin uh, or anything else racism related, sure, please call in. I'm sorry, Justice. Continue. Oh, Justice, are you there? Oh, hello. Yes, ma'am. I, I, I didn't mean to cut you off. I just wanted to let the people, they were asking if they could still call in. I wanted to let them know they could. Um, if you wanted to finish your, your statement, please, ma'am. Oh, um, that was, that was uh, the only, yeah, and I had one more question for him. Oh, what, yeah. do you do, what do you do when you are around white people mm. who practice racism and white supremacy? Hmm. Now that, two questions. 
that would have been interesting because it seems like he was around some white people who practiced racism, white supremacy uh, in his book. Uh, the guy that he was talking about who said white people are the apple of God's eye, it seems like he was around some white people who are racist. So he, uh, he, would have, he would have probably been able to give you some very interesting answers as to what he does when he's around these white people. Um, seems like he takes notes. He wrote a book. Seems like he takes notes, which I would say that's a good suggestion. Take notes if you're around white people who are uh, who are racist or doing things that you think could be racist. Take notes so that uh, you can you can write it down and share it with other people. Um, mm-hmm. Might be good if you want to. Go ahead. Um, uh, I think I should actually ask that question uh, when. Uh, when this show just uh, first started, mm-hmm. yeah, this show I should ask that question first, because <laughs> I would get lost. I bet I would get lost information from him if I asked that question. Yeah, that was. Uh, we both should have asked the question. We both missed uh, missed out on asking a question. It was I think two people in the chat room uh, were curious about uh, the sex thing. I was curious about that myself, gang. I uh, wish I had. Uh, Wish I had taken time to uh, ask him if he, uh, in fact, is or has been engaged in sexual intercourse with a white person. But I felt like I was having to uh, felt like I was having to do some juggling to make sure I did not cause conflict with a non-white person, which I suspected from reading his book. And I think I did a pretty good job. Yay, Gus, and yay, Justice. I think we did a very good job of not having conflict with a non-white person and asking questions in a very courteous manner. And uh, still getting some, you know, interesting information. I think we did well uh, in managing the program to not have conflict yeah. today. And then I also had another question. Let's hear it. Uh, it was because uh, I think um, he was talking about like in a church mm-hmm. or something mm-hmm. that uh, that um, the person told the people to um, hug and like uh, put their arms around. Mm-hmm. Uh huh. Um, I was gonna ask him why did they uh why did the people want uh them to do that? I think uh I've been to a few churches in my time on the planet and I think that's uh that's pretty common uh in in a lot of churches if you go to. Like they uh, at some point they'll say you can turn to the person that you're sitting next to and uh give them a hug or, you know, something just to be nice and friendly. Uh that's pretty common. I've done that often uh, in going to church. Um, I just, I thought it was very interesting because in the book, and he said on the show, uh, he's sitting next to this white person who was just like, uh, no way. Don't touch me. Don't even think about it. I, uh, I, I thought that was very, uh, very interesting. And it's in the book. If you, you know, have the time to read, uh, read his work, uh, Searching for Whitopia, uh, it's in the book. Uh, lots of colorful anecdotes of these white people. Um, who, uh, you know, I suspect are racist and uh, just sharing their views on non-white people and how they don't like non-white people or not interested in spending time with them. Um, let's see. There was one person who called in. We'll see if they have any, any questions or comments. Uh, you're showing up as 111. Do you have any questions or comments, 111? Hello? <laughs> yes, we can hear you. Oh, this is Lauren Ashley. Oh, <laughs> right on, Lauren oh, Ashley. Oh, my God. I feel kind of bad. But, Why do you feel uh, bad? Well, because it's like so kind of obvious, and uh, just restricting it. He uh, was on the Tom Jordan show, and he was talking about Black Mormons, right? And how she was so confused, but couldn't come to admit it. You know what I mean? They, they're just different white people. So, but it's a learning experience, so. Oh, for sure, for <laughs> sure. I learned. I, I thought it was. He shared the church. Didn't you think his church uh, anecdote was interesting? And, oh yes, uh, very very interesting. Yeah, I uh, learning experience. And as I said, from reading his book, I uh, strongly suspected that he was going to say he did not think we were in a system of racism, white supremacy. Uh, just that one sentence in the book where he said, "You have racism without racist." I knew there was probably going to be a lot of disagreement uh, between his views and my views. Um, you know, hey, what can you do? What can you do? Very interesting. Uh, he's a non-white person. I'm confused. I suspect he might have some confusion about all this as well. And uh, in the book it says uh, he wrote that he has a non-white sibling who is in a sexual relationship with a white person. So, you know, 
you know. Mm-hmm. If you've been listening to the cows, you already know how I feel about that. So, you know, um, yeah, uh, one of the uh, back of the bus, he's asking that you plug uh, your uh, T-shirt line, please, Lauren Ashley. Um, well, it's a text reality. It's a um, really, how can I say, it could be controversy to some people. It's uh, for people who can actually stand the ground on the T-shirt they're wearing. A lot of statements from the T-shirts that uh, you people are going to ask questions, to say the least. Like I have uh, a replaced white supremacy with Justin collection, and then have other collections, like about religion and stuff like that. But, yeah, it's really, you have to know what you're talking about when you're wearing these shirts. You have to be able to back it up. People are going to ask you questions, so be prepared for that. <laughs> be prepared for that. Might as well, like, you know, do a little rehearsal before you wear the shirt, because, yeah, a lot of things, a lot of it. Could you give us the website so people can uh, check out where these shirts are and speak up real loud so we can hear it? Oh, okay. It's um, Taste Reality, C-H-A-S-T-E-R-E-L-I-C-Y dot Spread Shirt, S-C-R-E-A-D-S-H-I-R-T dot com. Okay. I'll put it in the chat room. Thank you. That would be helpful. And if uh, you can check my blog, racism-notes.blogspot.com. Uh, the last post I did is about uh, her T-shirts, her counter-racist T-shirts. Phenomenal. You can see two of the shirts that she did, and there is a link um, in the blog that will take you to her website. So if you get confused or if you miss it in the chat room or if you're not listening at Blog Talk Radio, go to the blog. You'll see her, and you'll see a very cute picture of Lauren Ashley. You can go to her website, check out her blog, join the fan club, all that good stuff. Um, uh-oh, you might have some people who want to know about your shirts. Two other folks called in. We had somebody else that called at 111. Are you there as well? Greetings, Renegade. Hello, sir. 720, how are you doing? I'm okay. Hi, hi, hello, Justice. How are you? I'm doing fine. Good. Um, I, I had a question, Renegade. Uh, did your guest uh, know that uh, your show is uh, normally two hours? Uh, yes, he did. Um, he, he, I spoke with his publicist, uh, publisher. Excuse me. And uh, they said that he had been doing a lot of programs, and he didn't think he would be able to do the full two hours, but he felt he'd be able to do an hour. Um, And I said that was fine, no big deal. Um, I suspect at this point, as I said, today is show number 50 for the cows. No celebration or anything, but, you know, hey, 50 shows. Um, I suspect I might be... uh, I might not be accepting of people down the road who are not willing to do the full program unless you are somebody I really, really want on the program because uh, I just feel like we need two hours to get to the callers and get to all the information. So might be one of the last times you hear somebody on the program who is not staying for the full two hours. Well, it was, well, yeah, well, it, it was very interesting. His book is interesting. This is a, a suggestion from uh, Miss Lauren Ashley on the line with us. She, uh, I don't know if she saw the book or the website, but, uh, yeah, she, she found out about Mr. Benjamin and suggested that I uh, nab him for the program, and he was willing to, uh, to chat for a while. So, you know, you found it interesting. Thank Miss Lauren Ashley. <laughs> well, well, thank you, Miss Ashley. I thought the show was, for, for the little that I heard, it was extremely interesting. Yes, thank you. Excuse my eyes were laughing, but yeah. It's okay. Yeah, no to laugh sometimes. For sure, especially on the non white team. We have uh so much that is not funny. Anytime you can steal a laugh, I think it's uh and laughing is healthy. White people have a lot of books where they talk about how uh yeah. <laughs> laughing is very healthy and it promotes healing in your body. They've done extensive research on this. So if you can find something to laugh about and it's not a non white person being mistreated, laugh away. Uh one other person joined in and I uh, wanna see if they had anything to add as well. Nine eight zero, are you there? Yes, good afternoon. How are you doing today? I'm well, sir. How are you? Good, good. I was um, yeah. Uh, this whole this whole conversation about 
about race and you know uh, and racism, you know there, there always has to be the insertion about the conversation of, of class. Um, I have a friend, you know, that's you know from New York. I'm from New York as well. Are you a and white person or a non-white person? Wow, you can't tell. I'm, I'm actually black. I'm black. Okay, just got to okay. got to check. I could okay. be wrong. Okay, I get that sometimes because my name special. But um, <laughs> in, in any event, you know, we come from two different spectrums in terms of socioeconomic class. You know, I'm 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 originally from the South Bronx, the poorest neighborhood in the country per capita. Right, he comes from a family where you know pops worked for Goldman Sachs, his moms worked for J.P. Morgan Chase. Um, now they did work their way up, you know they you know they went to grad school and got MBAs and all that good stuff. But like our, our views are totally different. So in his mind, you know, because he's he's a he's pretty multicultural. He's like part Belizean, he's part uh, he's part Chinese, part this, part that. And he doesn't think that, you know, there is a system of of racism that exists in in this country and the world. And his, his argument that it's more about class than it is about race, but the two can't not be, um, cannot really be separated. They're actually inextricably linked. And so, you know, the, you know I've, I've been on several shows where, you know, they, they lean toward more, would you would consider uh, um, a, a conservative uh, slant. And I, I was on a show one night where there was a, a young lady, she was from New York, and another guy from New York, he's a, a black guy who subscribes to conservative philosophy. And, you know, there was a, a guy who he had on his show who was saying some very inflammatory things about black women, you know, particularly about their anatomy, how they're different than white women. And, you know, he talked about his, his own family in which someone came into his home who was trying to date his niece. And the guy had dreads and he had baggy jeans on and he had all these different things that were not, were kind of international to what he, he represented as being a, a culturally conservative white male from the foothills of West Virginia, but he lived in Pittsburgh. And the point being that, you know, he, you know when he talked about, and he, you know, we talked on several different occasions. I, I listened to a lot of different shows to get different viewpoints, and I, I talked about healthcare. And he said, "Well, I like listening to you because you sound, you sound rational. You sound, you, you know what you're talking about." So when I said, I said, now when he said all these inflammatory remarks, he made the comment saying, "Now, Thomas, he said, if you came to my home, and you you came, you know, with, uh, you dressed a certain way." I, and my daughter really loves you. I, I'd be willing. I'd be willing to to give her my blessing. Now I, I'm not looking for anyone's blessing, but then there's something we have to take into consideration that either if we're going to be in this society, we have to ask ourselves some very serious questions. If you're going to be, for instance, like if you're a young man and you're going to wear you know dreads, know why you're wearing dreads. And if you're going to wear dreads, that means you're not going to work for anyone. That means you are basically saying, I'm not going to participate in this economic system. And therefore, that's great. That means you're your own man, but you, have, but you can't go to someone's job and look a certain way and not expect them to feel uncomfortable about what that represents. So, you know, we have to make some decisions about, you know, you know when you start talking about assimilation, you know, and, and you know, are, we, are we either going to be a part of society and not saying that you have to give up your cultural identity and not, you know, yearn to learn more about your own heritage. But there, there has to be a conversation about, you know, there's certain things that we we do amongst ourselves, and there's certain things you have to do in order to be part of society, but that doesn't mean that, you know, you, you have to do a quote-unquote sell out or you have to uh, not be true to who you are. Okay. Hang hang on one second, 980, because you, you said a lot. Um I'll, I'll defer today. It's program number 50 for the cows. We're having fun now. I will defer. Miss Ashley, did you have a comment that you wanted to make based on what you heard? Um, I think that class stuff is really a uh, bull. Um, if, uh, if uh, white supremacists want to practice white supremacy, they don't do it. They don't care where classes come from. I'll give you uh, my own personal experience. I was uh, applying for a job, right? And my uncle, the rest was with my uncle. And it was this young white female. She had no job experience. 
the job we were applying for, right? And I was basically told I was going to get the job. Well, uh, when I got hired, I didn't get hired for the job. Here's a white female. We both look professional, mind you. Here's a white female who didn't have any experience at all with job experience. She had any experience in the, the job we were applying for, but yet she got the position over me, and I got a lower position. So I think that class thing is really middle of all, especially when I just came home from training from the military. So here I am, supposed to be a, you know, over here, woo hoo woo hoo and I feel not better than somebody, a white person, who doesn't have who doesn't have any qualifications for the job. That doesn't make sense. So I think that's really bull crap. Hmm. So. Uh, seven two zero. Did you have a comment you wanted to make to uh, nine zero eight? His uh, his commentary. I'm gonna come back to you as well. Nine eight nine eight zero. Sorry. I, I think for the most part, I've had similar experiences uh, like uh, Miss Ashley. Hmm. Um, I, I don't think I don't think class is uh, in the mix at all. I think it boils straight down to white supremacy. Hmm. Uh, Justice, did you have any any comments on uh, what nine eight zero what he shared with us? Um, no, but I do have something about the church. Um, yeah, I did have something about the church. Let's hear it. Um, I think I know why that that white lady didn't want to, um... I'm sorry for laughing. I was listening to your story. Why do you think the white lady didn't want to, uh, didn't want to touch him? Maybe because, well, was that a white person? Uh, yes, he said it was okay. a white person. Okay, then I think she was practicing white supremacy. I think you are probably correct. Uh, I could be wrong, but I suspect you are correct that she probably was practicing uh, white supremacy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, my my thoughts, um, Mr. Ninety. Though I'm gonna bring you back in so you can respond to what you've heard. My thoughts. Um, when I have discussions of racism, white supremacy. I, I like to slow things down um, because there were a lot of terms that you used that uh, I, I don't think are ever brought up on this program. Uh, assimilation, sellout. Uh, there were quite a few of them. I wrote some of them down uh, while you were talking. Uh, they just they just never come up uh, on this program. Conservative, that was another one. Uh, if I was talking to a white person, the conversation would stop as soon as one of those words came out because the same thing with Mr. Benjamin where he used the term racism. That was key, and I hope people caught that. He used the term racism, and he did not have a definition for racism. He said interpersonal racism, structural racism, and he defined those two terms. He never defined Racism, and he does use the term racism in his book. I quoted him, page 185, where he used the term racism, and he never defined it. That is a huge problem, and that is a pattern that I see in discussions of racism where people throw around these terms, and these are huge, important terms, and they have no definition. You do not get clarity in those types of discussions. It leads to confusion, and it generally leads to the non-white person being mistreated. So I generally stop everything and request a definition for the term. Um, so assimilation and, and, and sellout, particularly that one, because people get upset and end up throwing names around it, and nobody defines what they mean when they say sellout. Um, with regards to class, when I have asked people who use that term to explain what they mean when they say class, inevitably, white people end up constituting a class to themselves in the system of white supremacy. And every white person that I have said that to when they have explained class has said yes. White people, that's according to their own definition, white people would be a class to themselves in the system of white supremacy. So. This program, no, we don't talk about class because I have concluded the class is the white class system of white supremacy. 
That is what we're talking about, racism, people being mistreated because they're not white. White people decide, the most powerful white people who run the system of white supremacy, they decide who's going to be in whatever so-called class that you have. They are in charge of that at the end of the day. So I would much rather focus on that as opposed to focusing on, you know, non-white people who have a certain amount of money or what have you or perceived to be in an upper class, Oprah Winfrey or uh, Danny Glover, someone said in the chat room, uh, white people allow Oprah Winfrey and Danny Glover and uh, President Barack Obama, white people allow these non-white people to exist in the first place. If white people didn't want them there, they wouldn't be there. So that's why this program, we focus on racism, white supremacy. And if I had two seconds for the dread thing, uh, I know non-white people who have dreadlocks, who are not poor, who are not broke. They work for white people, and they make a lot of money. White people don't have a problem with them having dreads. Um, I would simply say just be aware of your environment, be aware of what it is you're trying to do, and uh, try to get as much information as possible to function in whatever environment that you're going in, whether it means if you're going to have dreads or how you're going to wear your clothes or whatever, if you are a non-white person, but most importantly, inform yourself about racism, white supremacy, so that you can deal with that appropriately. I know tons of non-white people who don't have dreads and they don't have a job. They've been mistreated. They don't have anything. I know tons of non-white people who are like that. I also know non-white people who do have dreads, and they're doing pretty well. They're on a house. They're doing whatever. At the end of the day, they're all still victims of racism. So I would say the most important thing, inform yourself about racism, whatever you're going to do, and uh, be very careful in the way you conduct yourself with white people. That's what I would say. Um, did you have a, uh, you have a, a, a comment or on based on what you heard, Nani, though? Yeah, yeah I'm still here. Um, and, and, yeah, that's that basically just as it is this. You know, when I, I talked to you about my, my, my colleague and my friend who, you know, they, they're actually, like I said, they, they consider themselves, they're, they're basically black, but they consider themselves to be multicultural. He made the argument that there's not a system. I, I, don't, I don't necessarily subscribe to that, but, Kind of along the same lines that you're saying, be aware of the, the, the surroundings, the, the circumstances you're in, and, and decide which, which you know, tack you're, you're going to take in life. Um, you know, I've, I've been, uh, you know, been subjected to various situations where I know that there was a, an agenda of, um, of white supremacy or racism. Um, but my, my thing is, like I said, we always have to, we have to be careful about, once again, the, the images that are being portrayed about us in in the public, like for instance, you know, you look at what's going on right now. You know, you got you know these, these rappers going to jail, you know, for, for for various charges, and you know that's an image that you know that's that's you know allowed to be promoted, of course, through uh, the corporatocracy. You have you know certain people that are in power that want to promote that image, right? Versus, you know, you have the people who actually have a positive message that aren't being heard. But the people who want to act like a baboon go out there and, you know, they, they, make, they make it very difficult for us to be taken seriously. But be that as it may, the system, as you, as you say, of white supremacy is here. And understanding it, like you said, knowing that, one, you know, no matter what you do in a lot of cases, they'll still always see you as just a monkey. You know, unfortunately, that's the way that's the way it is, and you have to understand it. They, that's the, and what I've encountered over the years is that, you know, even though you know with you know with the, the various things that I've done in my life, you know, it always somehow it, it always you know comes back to their perception, you know, and and unfortunately their perception controls a lot of the the agenda, and the only thing we can try to do. Just like, you know, the conversation we're having right now, I appreciate the fact that you, you are countering what I was saying without, without attacking it in such a way with, with, with vitriol and with a, lot of, with a lot of venom in your speech. Because I've been on another show. I'm not, I'm not defending this uh, assistant white supremacy because I believe there's a lot of people who are gatekeepers, you know, who basically are there. They're, uh, like you said, they're allowed to be there because, you know, someone else, has decided that they are acceptable, but you know, but my, my my bigger point is is that you know we have to do a better job of controlling perception, and and we that's the thing we have to control, we have control just like the like I said the way you're conducting this program, 
is a testament to that. We can control our perception. The conversation that, for instance, if you have with a Caucasian person, okay, or European, because we need to even be more specific because uh, not all white people are necessarily European. So, you know, let's, let's talk about European, uh, you know, way of thinking and understand that their agenda um, is strictly about control and, and keeping everyone in check. And, uh, you know, like I said, I appreciate the fact that your conversation is, 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 is rational and it's very controlled. And that, that's all I have to say that. Oh, no problem. I, thank you for uh, tuning in, Mr. 980. Um, I was going to comment. Somebody else called in. I want to bring them in uh, as well, see if they had anything to say. Uh, the injustice system, are you, do you have a comment, question, comment? Okay. I suspect they're just listening. I'll, I'll check back. Um, yeah, that, that's one of the things I try to do to work against racism, white supremacy, is to not uh, be discourteous when we talk about racism, white supremacy. I try to operate uh, this program being as courteous as possible. Uh, with both white people and non-white people being courteous. We don't have to agree. We're just exchanging views. Um, I don't claim to be an expert on much of anything, so I'm just sharing my views. The person, whoever it is, happens to be the guest on the program. They're sharing their views. People that call in, they're sharing their views. So try to be courteous, especially if it's non-white people. I believe everyone on the call now is a non-white person, so for sure I try to be on my best behavior if I'm talking to non-white people even if I think they're tripping, even if they don't agree that we're in a system of white supremacy, even if uh, they're having sex with a white person, whatever, I try to be as courteous as possible so that I do not have conflict with a non-white person. I think that's one thing we can all do to work against racism, white supremacy, really work to minimize the conflict that we have with other non-white people. Um, Ms. Ashley, 720, did you all have comments for what 980 shared with us? No. Okay. Seven two up. Did you have comment question? Oh, no comments. Okay. Justice comment question? No, but um, do we? Uh, are we have to wrap up? Uh, did you want to give your email address? Yeah, that yeah, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I probably can ask for the comment. Uh, we had a couple minutes, but if you want to, you can tell them now that, to make sure that they get it. You can tell them a couple times. Okay. Justice.asap at yahoo.com. Outstanding. Justice.asap at yahoo.com. Um, yeah, I, I for sure. Again, I just reiterating. No conflict with non-white people. I try to be courteous even when I have white people on the program. Even when Tim Wise was here, I think I was courteous. Not rude with Mr. Wise. Try to be as courteous as possible when discussing racism. I think that's one thing that also um, keeps us from making progress, particularly non-white people. Uh, we tend to get very emotional and uh, engage in name-calling and things when we talk about racism, and it just uh, is not productive, uh, doesn't, doesn't get results. So I think that's one thing we can all do is try and be a little more calm, a little more rational when we talk about racism, and I can make improvements on that myself. Um, one thing I did want to share the uh, racism conference was in Seattle yesterday. Man, oh man. Um, I did not attend the racism conference. Uh, I was distracted. Um, Lauren Ashley had me uh, online, so I was not able to attend the conference, so it should be her fault. Um, but some of my non-white pals did attend the racism conference, and uh, they saw some very interesting things. Um, Yellow Manny was there, and I spoke with him. Um, I will share one thing that he reported uh, from the conference. Uh, he said he was speaking to other non-white people, a lot of people at this thing. Uh, he was speaking to some other non-white people, and a non-white male, uh, so-called black male, jumped into their conversation. He didn't know this person. He jumped into their conversation and just started talking to them. And he said, yeah, you know, I, I've never been to this conference before. This was the seventh year of the Seattle Race Conference. Uh, and the black male, he said, I, I'd never even been to this conference before. I didn't know anything about it. And the planning committee, they just asked me, they said, hey, you should come in and join the planning committee. And uh, he, he continued to talk, and he said, uh, he was going to, to vote for President Obama, or I guess before he was President Obama, he was going to vote, 
and uh, he had his uh, Barack Obama hat, and he had his Barack Obama button, and uh, he was going to the poll, and he said a group, they were having a party for President Obama, or he wasn't president at the time, they were having a party for uh, Mr. Obama, and uh, they were like, hey, you should come in, he's going to win, he's going to win, come celebrate, and the black man, he said, well, I haven't even voted yet. It doesn't matter. He's going to win. He's going to win. Just come in and party with us. You've got your gear, gear on. It's celebration time. Hooray. And so he went in and he partied. He didn't even vote for President uh, Obama, but he had his gear on. Uh, and I, I just I cracked up laughing when I, when I heard this. Uh, Yellow Manny said he, he felt as though uh, the white people who organized this event, uh, like they just snatched a non-white person, like, hey, we'll have more diversity on the committee. Get this guy. Put him on the committee. Um, I don't know. I wasn't there. This was reported to me, um, so that maybe that's not the case. But uh, that was reported to me. Um, he said he he felt like it was a lot of venting. Um, non-white people given an opportunity to vent about their mistreatment. Didn't really see a lot of suggestions and things that we should be doing to work against racism, white supremacy. Um, I don't know. Maybe the cows is guilty of the same thing. I don't know. Maybe I don't give out suggestions either. But he said he didn't. He didn't feel uh, what he observed was very constructive, and uh, he just he thought that was very amusing. The encounter that he had with the black male. But uh, I'm hoping to uh, perhaps snag some other people who were at the conference, uh, or some of the coordinators themselves to come on the program. Maybe they could share uh, what their goal is for the conference. Uh, it's like it's going for seven years now. It's a lot longer than the cows. Um, you know, with with how long they think this thing is going to go on, what they think was accomplished yesterday. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm hopefully we can we can do that down the road. Um, yeah, that very interesting. I'm I'm actually kind of glad I did not invest my time in going to the conference yesterday because uh, from what I heard, and I talked to another non-white person, Justice was actually at the conference yesterday. I forgot. Justice, you can tell them what you saw. She was at the conference. I saw um, this video about these um, these so-called Asians. Actually, yeah, they were uh, Vietnamese. They were Vietnamese, and there was this um, disease going on, and they didn't get the proper help that they needed. They uh, and so the white people they tried to help them. And they built some houses and uh, for them, and they had this um, thing. I don't know what it's called, but it was it helps them bring the outside air in. Hmm. But it was, but some of the particles. Um, that was outside uh, wasn't good for them. And so uh, at night, um, her son, I don't know what is her son's name, but um, she couldn't go to the job and so she couldn't pay bills. Mm. And then about the thing that I was talking about, the air. Mm. Hmm. And this it was, was, it was, ta- oh, go it ahead. was talking about the air was the outside air wasn't okay, but the inside air it would bring the outside air in, mm-hmm. but it would but it would block um, the things that was outside that was bad. Okay. And then um, that's how it helped the. Uh, the and um, there was also some gunshot <laughs> that was um going on um over there. Mm. I think it was in Vietnam, and just kids would just be outside playing, and the adult and the uh, adults would be inside. Mm. And they would be watching them, but like the people who and I, and I think they were white people, mm. the white people who were shooting the guns they shot some of the kids, uh, the kids. Hmm. And I 
they also yeah that's uh I can't think of any more right now but uh, that was part, um, part of the show that I saw because I didn't see all of it mm. I came there a little late did you see a lot of white people at the conference um it was uh it was I would say about like six, seven people inside that conference, and the rest of them were non-white. So it was. Do you think it was more non-white people? Did you see more non-white people than white people? It was like an even amount. I can't. I can't really tell. But it's even. Okay. okay. And then uh, the white people that were there, they said that they were uh, they were trying to work to, uh, to produce justice. Hmm. Do you, based on what you saw, do you think they were there to produce justice? Justice. Um, this depends uh, for each person. I don't know. <laughs> I did that. I probably wouldn't know either. All those people that would. Uh, I probably need more information. Um, yeah, that that's interesting. Interesting. And then they, uh, and after when they, after when we watched the video, mm. the overhead, mm. the teacher said, go ahead and turn to us from uh, somebody next to you. And and say hi and maybe meet friends or talk about the video and what you learned. Hmm. And, yeah, that's what, uh, and the teacher was non-white. Okay. She was the one who uh, ran that, con- uh, that, um, that part of the, Um, um, that room mm. because there's because there's lots of rooms. So oh, that's she was the one who um, run that room. Okay. Wow. Yeah, the conference. Uh, the report. I forgot all about justice was at the at the show. Half of the cows was at the conference. Um, yeah, she. I, I spoke to several folks who were there. Um, and they, I guess, went to different different workshops that they had, like uh, Justice was talking about, and uh, very interesting reports I got back. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, maybe I should have gone, and 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 we could have all chatted uh, from the from the from the conference to share what we saw. But <sighs> very interesting. Apparently, they did not replace white supremacy with justice yesterday. So. More work to be done. I suspect they'll be back next year with another conference and uh, more interesting stories to share. Um, there is a white person, I believe, who called in who said he wanted to share with the group. This, uh, are you there in justice system? Are you there? You're on the line if you if you uh, want to share. You're on the air. If you would like to share, you uh, you said you had something you wanted to say in justice system. Okay, I'm not hearing him. He was in the chat room. This is uh, his person says he's a white person, and he said he uh, wanted to share his his experiences with uh, racism, and uh, he he said uh, that he has a black girlfriend. So interested to hear uh, what he had to say, but I uh, am not able to get him on. Hi, Khadija. See you in the chat room. Um, did you all have anything else you wanted to uh, to share? Any other interesting experiences or theories? I know Lauren Ashley, she shared her theory with me uh, yesterday about uh, non-white females who are having offspring at a very young age. Did you want to share that with our listeners so they could think about it or anything else? Uh, no. You can't know. Yeah. It's not my theory. It's it's. it's I know, not my but uh, my dick is not as good as yours, so yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, we all got to learn. Uh, <laughs> white people could uh, could kill Gus 
today, and, uh, you know, hopefully somebody would step up uh, and to mm-hmm. continue the work. I mean, you know, we all got to do our part, you know. Okay. Um, well, my theory on um, non-whites, particularly uh, black females who get pregnant at their, like, in teenage years, you know, teenage pregnancy, is that they do it out of a kind of a survival instinct, so to speak, where the media tells them that, you know, all black men want, or non-white men really want is a white woman, and when they get older, they will leave you with the baby's mother. Well, it's just a girlfriend, really. Leave the non-white girlfriend for the white girlfriend when they actually make you big, so to speak. And then they give you examples, they meaning non, uh, meaning, meaning white people, give you examples of, you know, non-white men who are with white women when they make it big, and usually they leave their non-white girlfriend. So, and then they're told that they're not desirable, they will be single. Because I, I forgot, they say 10% of black women are supposed to supposedly, quote-unquote, single or whatever, and they will never get married, um, that their black men will be in prison. Uh, what's the other one? They will be in prison, dead, that's one of them. So they got all this against them. So I think it's kind of a, a survival instinct. Like they have to continue their line before it's too late because they might not get that chance. So that's just the theory I have. Hmm. And some young black women. Oh, no, I, I was listening. Yeah. Hmm. That's it. <laughs> oh, okay. That's, that's it for the most. Oh, yeah. Oh, I forgot. Oh, yeah. Then they go to the church, and there's a lot of single women in the church, right? And then they hear it from their mothers, because, you know, uh, people talk, black people talk, and then they'll talk about in the rest of relationships how uh, they, he left his girlfriend, he left his non-white girlfriend for a white woman when he got some money, and so all that coming to the non-white girl, and so I think that's an act out of the survival. If that makes any sense. You now have uh, you can get feedback for uh, for your thing because, like I said, I I had not thought of that before, uh, and of course I'm not a female, so you know <laughs> I have very different uh, very different perspective on that. But uh, I thought it was very interesting. Um, perhaps seven two zero. Do you have a, a comment, or have you had you heard that theory before? Or how do you feel about that? I hadn't heard the theory before, but I too find it to be very interesting. Hmm. Very interesting. Hmm. I, I tell her I would have to marinate on it for a while. Because um, she said, uh, t- when she was explaining it to me, she said that she thought the younger non-white females might, uh, this might be an unconscious thing uh, where they're yeah. thinking, you know, I might, this might be my best opportunity, best time for me to, to have uh, offspring uh, because as I get older, um my opportunities are going to go down uh, for a myriad of reasons, uh, lack of availability, uh, not going to be as many black males to, to pick from. Uh, they're going to be chasing white women down. They're going to be in jail. They're going to be gay, blah, 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 blah. Uh, this will be my best chance to, to have a child. Uh, this not is what they're told. This, this is what they're told. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, like by everyone, by the media, you know, they hear from other black people. So then it too, like, the fiction becomes truth. So, yeah. Hmm. Hopefully, the folks who are listening in the chat room, they uh, they can ponder on this and uh, see if, you know, what they have experienced matches up, and uh, perhaps they'll give you some feedback, let you know if they, uh, they think this could be what's happening on a subconscious level, that some of the non-white females are thinking, my gosh, this system is uh, really making it disastrous, uh, my prospects for having a great family and, and having uh, children when I get older, I need to do this now. This will be my best chance. Um, maybe you'll get some feedback on that. I know uh, Professor Dorothy Roberts, I know she talked about in her book that uh, fertility rates for black females have been dropping, uh, and that's something that is not talked about, and people don't even think that. They, they just automatically stereotype and think black people are super fertile. She said the evidence does not support that at all, that fertility rate for black females has been dropping, um, probably due to the stress of racism, white supremacy. So 
you should add that to the theory perhaps. Um, mm -hmm. But, yeah, I, I will think on it, and hopefully uh, people can give feedback. They can contact you about the shirts or your theory on uh, teen pregnancy. Um, I know 980 is still with us. If you had a comment, uh, if you want to talk about that, or if you had another comment, you're there as well, 980. Yeah, hello. Um, you know, like I said, the other, the other great thing I'm, I'm listening to, you know, like I said, and I want everyone to understand where I'm coming from with, with my comments, you know, is that, you know, there's a lot of people that instead of talking about like this as a, a common agenda who, are, who try to indoctrinate you into a system of belief, which is equally as dangerous as, uh, you know, uh, no, I can't say equally as dangerous. I, I strike that from the record. But, um, you yeah, know, there's certain people who say, for instance, they want to convert you into another belief system, okay? And, and that's what's important here is that you're talking about a common agenda, and it's not about indoctrinating you into, you know, into noble Jewelry's belief or, uh, or, or, you know, becoming a Hebrew Israelite or, be, you know, there's a lot of people that they want to convert you into something else instead of, you know, focusing on the main issue. So I, I want to just put that out there. That so I think this is great that you know you're not talking about another belief system. You're having a, a rational discussion about an issue that affects people on a wide scale, regardless of what their their faith is or regardless of what their circumstances. Oh well, I appreciate that as well. I, I for sure don't have a. Uh religion or anything that I can sign people up uh, and say this is what we should be doing, this is what we should belong to, the uh, Church of Gus T. Renegade and Justice. Uh, no, that's that's not what I'm about. I'm just hopefully uh, the goal is to provide constructive information uh, for people to think about, uh, for non-white people to think about uh, the system of racism, white supremacy, and hopefully it will help them make better sense of things that are happening to them and how we can work to replace racism, white supremacy with justice. Um, I, re I think that's another thing that has held non-white people up from making progress is that we get uh, kind of bogged down in uh, really petty things, you know. This is, I'm a, I'm a, as you said, I'm a Israelite and you're a Hebrew or a Christian or Muslim or Baha'i or whatever and we're going to fight about that or uh, I'm from uh, this street, you're from that street, so we're going to fight about that and that just, I mean, that's not the major problem on the planet. The major problem is the system of racism, white supremacy. I feel like that's what we should be focused on. Those are the only people that I have a problem with. I do not have a problem with any other non-white people for any other reason. The only problem I have is with the white people who practice racism, white supremacy. That's it. I, can, I don't really care about all the other stuff that we get into. That's fine. We can work around that. I can, we don't need to be best pals anyway. We're not signing up for a group. There is no group. We're just individuals working against racism, individuals working to establish justice. So, yeah, that's that's all we're about here, just having, hopefully, intelligent and uh, courteous exchange of views uh, with helpful information. I hope that is the goal. Maybe we accomplish it, maybe we don't, but that's what we're shooting for. So, uh, yeah, if you found it of value, right on. Maybe we did a good job today. You can uh, perhaps share it with other non-white people that you know if you think they might find something of value with what we're doing here. Did you uh, did you have a, a additional comment, uh, nine eight zero? Are you still with us? Oh yes, I'm still here. I, I thought you cut my mic off. <laughs> oh no no no, you're with us. Yeah. All right. I just well, I was just trying to give you a chance to, to respond. Yeah, like I said, it's all, all good comments. And like I said, I've you know, like I said, I, you know, I work. You know, sometimes when you work in a, in a corporate environment, mm -hmm. um, you, know, you 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 get a chance to see people for you know, you know, because for, for whatever reason. You know, they they get to be comfortable around you just because you you're in that environment, and so I guess they they make the assumption that you have uh, similar beliefs. And sometimes, you know, it, it's just very um, it's a very it's a very interesting exercise in people watching and, and human behavior. And you know, I was just in in the office the other day, and my manager he um he made a comment about you know we we do statistics. We we started doing different types of uh, of investigations into to demographics. And say, for instance, they start talking about, you know, the, the Hispanic population will be approximately 137.5 million come uh, year 2050 and how, uh, you know, 
black people will be somewhere in the neighborhood of about 80 to 90 million. And then, you know, uh, Asians will be um, somewhere in the neighborhood of about 75 to 80 million. And he said, oh, my God. You know, so <laughs> so with that knowledge, you know, we you have to understand they, they, you know, the realization that, you know, that they're, you know, the days are numbered in terms of being even a majority of the country because when you start to think about it, when you look at it realistically, you know, and, and this goes back to the ISIS papers, the whole idea of, um, you know, they, they know that, you know, they, they are in a position where they're, they're compromised in terms of their numbers. There's just your numbers in the world. There's only a few places in the world where there's actually a majority of, of people who are Caucasian. And even in this country, coming the next, you know, couple of decades, uh, they will be a minority. And so, you know, and we have to be able to leverage that and understand that they're saying that, you know, black people will, you know, actually represent a trillion dollars in economic activity. But the only problem with that is if we don't educate ourselves and change our mindset and adjust our value systems, um, you know, that it will be for naught because we'll basically have the spending power of some a G20 nation, but we won't be able to leverage it and use it to our advantage. Very interesting. Mr. Mr. Benjamin, uh, I guess for today's program, he talks about that in his book, how uh, a lot of the white people that he uh, spoke with during his book, that they were very conscious of the fact that uh, white people are projected to no longer be the majority in this area of the world, uh, the, the rising tide of non-white people, so to speak, that they were very conscious of that, and a lot of them were talking about that openly uh, when he was when he was doing his investigation for the book. So. Uh, I think a lot of white people are very concerned about that, and even in his book, uh, some of the folks suspected that this was going to cause an increase in racist white supremacist activity, even uh, explicitly um, showing their racist white supremacist dedication. So that that's definitely something to uh, be on the lookout for, for sure. Um, 631, uh, did you have a question? 631, you're on, like, on the air. Greetings. Greetings. How are you? Good. Uh, I have a question, and then I have a comment about something that I just heard. Um, the first question has something to do with uh, what I heard on another show. I can't remember the show, but someone had called in, and I think it was a young man that called in, and he said that if something is still happening to you, can you still be classified as a victim? Now, I know he was asking that. I don't think he was asking that because he disagreed with the actual um, phrase victim of, victims of white supremacy. I don't think he was trying to disagree with that. I think mm -hmm. he was trying to figure out what's another term that we can use because if we're still being treated presently, you know, the mistreatment is present and mm -hmm. basically in the near future, should we be using another term other than victim? Now, I... I agree. I mean, I can't think of any other word, but that's because I'm not a master of words. I, I couldn't tell you what other word I would use. But I was just wondering if you can um, elaborate on your answer to that. Like, why do you? Why would you still use the term victim? Um, because I think, uh, at least my understanding of the word, that even if you are currently being mistreated, that that would still um, that would still be, that would still qualify for being a victim. Uh, you are currently being victimized. You are currently being mistreated. I don't think that uh, a victim is just something that's past tense where the mistreatment has ended. I think you can still be a victim and still continue to be facing harm and or mistreatment. So I don't think, uh, I don't think the term implies that your, your mistreatment has necessarily stopped. And I certainly make sure to emphasize that when I say victim that it is ongoing, the mistreatment and abuse that I and all other victims of white supremacy face is ongoing. So that's um, that's the way that I use the term, and that's that's the way that I try to make sure that I um, clarify and explain uh, when I do use the term, when people ask me why I use the term. Uh, thanks for clearing that up. I just wanted to make sure that was on the record because I I don't think you had a chance to uh, explain that in detail before. So I'm glad it's on the record now. Um, uh, I don't remember which show that was, but you're correct. It was recent, though. I don't remember the exact show. Yeah, it was a couple of shows ago, I think. Um, so the, the comment I also have is I just heard you mention something about, you know, the spending power that uh, the so-called black community would soon have, like a billion or something like that. I think I heard that, that wasn't me. 
Okay. I'm not really sure who said it. I think the I think the person from area code nine eight zero. Yeah, he's still on the line. If you Send yeah. It. Yeah, I think he said something Send about the spending power going up or something like that. Yes, ma'am, he did. Okay. So uh, the only reason why I I wanted to add something to that is because I think that the reason why there's so much talk from everyone, not just uh, black people about our spending power, but everybody about black people's spending power is because they know that we are the first ones to give up our money. And so since we're the first ones to give up our money, I mean, why do they talk about Chris Rock's good hair movie over and over and over again? It was, it was just getting nauseating hearing that in the news over and over again about this movie, Good Hair. And I figured out why they were talking about it so much. They were talking about it so much because they want to know where they can steal our money next. Okay, these people are really into their hair. They're really into spending a lot of money on their hair and hair products. Hey, now we know this is the, this is the direction we can go in to make, get more money from them. Simple as that. I mean, that, this is part of the reason why they talk about this stuff. It's part of the reason why they talk about, oh, we're going to have this many so-called Hispanic people in the United States by a certain year because they're, they're, they're trying to figure out ways of how they're going to still be able to dominate. You, can't, and you, you, you can only do that by trying to predict how things are going to go. I mean, most of, the, most of what they do is on a 25-year plan. You know, white supremacists do things on a 25-year cycle. It's not on a 50-year cycle or a 100-year cycle. Everything's in a certain cycle. So, that you know, well, how else are they going to be able to figure out what they can do next to screw us over? Well, 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 like well hello? Yes. Okay, yeah. Um, to kind of to, to, you know, to, uh, I guess piggyback what you're saying. Actually, when you say 25 years, I could actually these people don't think in 25 years. They they think they they they, they think. I mean, you'd be you'd be amazed at the the length that uh, people who are actually in control of, say, for instance, a uh, monetary system, the people who actually control the factors of production. Sweetheart, they think in terms of you know centuries. <laughs> they think in terms. These people, they don't think in 25 years. They think they really, they really think long term. That's the thing. We play checkers and they play chess. They're thinking their moves, their moves ahead. So this was just at a corporate level, things that they're exposed to us as employees that the, the major banking firm are going to work for, where the people who actually control things, like through the Federal Reserve and the IMF, you know, all these people, they, 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 they got economists. They have econometric models that they can, they can see things out 200 years at this point if they want to. So I want to make sure you understand. They're not thinking of a 25-year level. They're thinking, you know, centuries. They're thinking how they can remain in control for centuries to come. And in some cases, they have, you know, very, uh, very serious plans to try to limit population. So, you know, that's um, – so I want you everyone to be aware of that. that uh, if you've ever heard the David Rockefeller talk, who's – uh, he basically was one of the uh, major shareholders of J.P. Morgan uh, at one point, and still is. Um, he talks about population control, or population control of certain peoples. So um, just be aware of that. They're, they're not on a 25-year plan. They, they, they plan for, for a century. Okay. Okay. Um, so did uh, 631, did, I guess, did he address... Uh, your comment about the spending power in particular, because it seemed like you, um, that you, that was one point you were very emphatic about in terms of the white people uh, who practice racism making an effort to take uh, finances and money from non-white people through various schemes. Uh, and, and you were talking about how he earlier addressed the spending power that so-called black people have, and you felt that uh, racists uh, are always scheming to uh, – take advantage of that spending power and uh, take it from non-white people. Did, did he address that part of, uh, of your question or comment? Um, well, I, I actually just made the comment because I wasn't, I wasn't really – he didn't have to really address that particular, th particular thing. I was just making that point because I okay. just felt like it okay. needed to be – I just like it felt, I felt like it needed to be out there. Okay. That, 
somebody that somebody knows. I'm sure that every I'm sure everybody that heard me probably gets what I'm saying, and that is that we you know if we think about it, think about the logic behind it. You know why would they be doing all these things? Why would they even be discussing it? And the reason why they're discussing it is because of that reason. They have to you know finding ways to mistreat us over and over and over again. So you know that's yeah, what I, I really I, want to I, make so. Yeah, and I agree with that. I agree with that wholeheartedly. I guess my point is, to, what I was trying to say is that you're you're absolutely 100 percent right. But I want everyone else to know that these people think so long term that you wouldn't even believe. Like they they, they and especially in the banking and finance, because they, they that's why they have so many economists to be because econ, economics is really a social science. It's the science of scarcity. They, see, they develop the science of scarcity to support the system. And if you don't understand that, then it's going to be very hard to function. So the whole idea of, say, for instance, of this whole monetary crisis and credit crisis that has happened is because, you know, the, the credit bubble burst. And so what happens is, you know, they have to, you know, basically the government has to get involved to pump out more money, you know, to try to keep everything going. So you're right, the, the trillion dollars and, and, and and spending power that black people will have is just the tip of the iceberg. I mean, but now they're even, you know, if you look at some of these programs like CNBC, they're talking about further ways to exploit the African continent. They had a whole series on Africa, the last frontier. They're, they're going to try to rape and pillage the entire continent for every natural resource that they can get out of it. And so I want people to understand that. They, they don't think they play, they don't play checkers, they play chess. And that's why I wanted people. But you're, you're absolutely right. I wasn't disagreeing with you um, by any stretch of imagination. You're absolutely right. That the whole idea is that one trillion dollars. How much of it can they get? And that's why they. That's why you know the bank I was working for had produced those those results in their 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 econometric modeling, and they made it available to the employees and the department I worked in. Okay, so. Oh, thanks. Thanks for uh, providing your views to everybody. Now, another thing I wanted to mention, life insurance. I heard a art. I don't know if you guys heard about this, but um, I heard something on the news the other day about how employers are taking out life insurance policies on their employees. Has anyone heard this story? I have not. Okay. Um, well, they actually are taking out what they call dead peasant policy policies insurance policies on people. In other words, they take out a life insurance on their employee without them knowing about it. And the funny thing about it is that even long before you left your job, they still have a life insurance policy on you. So that if something happens to you, this happens to you they get to collect money on you, hmm. which is very interesting. And there's been quite a few lawsuits involved on this because you know, some families have found out that some of these companies have been collecting three hundred thousand dollars, five hundred thousand dollars, one point five million dollars on their loved ones without them knowing about it. Or, you know, at least they don't know about it until after after the fact, of course. Hmm. And they supposedly it's very hard to find out if someone has taken a life insurance policy out on you if you have worked for them. So just be aware of that. So, I mean, this is the kind of mistreatment. Now, I know um, Cree, you know, the lady that um, does the other show uh, on Blog Talk Radio. Oh, I know right, that right. she, oh, yeah, she has um, a racist on her blog. I know that she mentioned, and she also mentioned on a couple of shows, uh, very good points that she made about mistreatment that happens to us that we don't, we're not even aware of. You know, and these are some of the things that we are not aware of. Yeah, to, to to kind of, all right, well, she, she broached the topic. I actually worked in the insurance industry, <laughs> so she she actually is telling, you know, telling you the right stuff once again. Um, these these policies, <clears throat> it's shameful that these things even exist, but they, they, they do exist. Um, they, the, the policies that you most often hear about that the employer takes out, you hear about the key employee policies. Typically, your CEOs, um, CFOs, people who are, are, are in the, the management hierarchy, you hear about those publicly. But um, there are policies that they do take out. And the way insurance uh, law um, kind of works 
it doesn't necessarily provide that you necessarily have to, uh, there's an owner of the policy, and, you know, they can take, being that you, you represent the, 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 country, the company as an agent of the company, they take out these policies, I mean, they don't necessarily, it's not necessarily uh, required that you um, be beneficiary, right? So you can take out, so in other words, you can take out a policy and, you know, have it where, you know, if the policy is to cover, because a lot of insurance is to cover someone for economic loss. So it's like if you, you have a family and your wife takes out a policy on you and you take out a policy on your wife, some people take out a policy on children, not that popular, but um, there's an economic loss that happens due to the, the untimely demise. And so basically the whole concept behind the dead peasant policy is that you have an economic value that you lose as human capital. And I just so want you're, to you're say right. it's unfortunate because um, essentially what happens is, is that if you, let's say you, you know, most of our employers carry health insurance for people. That's who carries the health insurance policies are, you know, are people who are employers. And if they know they have, happen to have an employee, no matter what position they're in, they can be the janitor at the company. And if they know that they're suffering from some kind of ailment, like cancer or whatever the case may be that could be terminal, all they have to do, all they ever have to do is put out a life insurance policy on this person, which they could find out this stuff very easily because, again, they're holding the health insurance policy. So that's why I say I think that that I understand where you're coming from with what they're saying, and it used to be for key employees. I understand that. But yeah. now they're doing it on everybody, and it's almost like becoming, and they actually trade these policies on a market. I mean, I don't know if everybody knows that, but I just wish that we can get somebody on the show that can talk more to this, these insurance policies because I think that there's got to be some way to find out if people are betting on your life because I think that that's a problem. To me, that's a problem. If you, I just wanted to, if you could, uh, if you could get, because I hadn't heard of this. So if you know, or anybody on the call, if you know more about this, and this is something you all think we should uh, address on the program, if you all could get me information, somebody if they've done a book or somebody if they're investigating this right now, um, I will definitely check it out. But I just, I was ignorant of this. So if uh, if you six three one, if you seems like you know more about this, if you know somebody who you think would be willing to come chat with us, uh, you can shoot me the information. We'll see if we can make it happen. Okay, I'll see if I could try. I can actually send you because I know your uh, I got your address, your email address. So I'll send you um, the article. I'll okay. see if I can find it and uh, send it to you okay. or some kind of video because I th I think I heard it on the news. But if I can find the YouTube video or the article, I'll send it to you. And then okay. I'll see what I could do as far as getting somebody on the show because that's to me right there is a problem. You know, I mean these it, I mean these insurance companies made money off slavery, which was just one form of racism, white supremacy. Now they're doing it this way. They, you know, it's, it's just it's just a never-ending cycle with the kind of stuff that they're doing to us. And then somebody like Henry Kissinger comes along and starts calling people useless eaters and they're trying to depopulate areas because they think we're so stupid. And I'm beginning to think that maybe we are. Maybe we are because, I mean, I hate to say that, but maybe we are because, you know, this stuff keeps happening and no one seems to be able to break the cycle. So I mean, at some point we should be able to break the cycle. Victims, that's why I use the term victims, that our, our ignorance is a principal part of our victimization. I think white people have done an exemplary job in withholding constructive information from non-white people and that is one of the key uh, one of the key parts of our victimization that's why I use that term all the time victims 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 more than anything um, 631 I had I had two requests uh, this is quite uh, quite a quinky dig that you called in uh, I know who this person is um, I was just speaking with Miss Ashley, who is also on the phone, about Mike Stone, who I'm sure you remember, who yeah, was on Miss Alexis K. Tyler's program uh, several times, talking about his affinity for black females. And I believe the third time he was on her program, he was with another non-white female who is married to a white person. And she was talking about her experiences and blah, blah, blah. And you called the program to ask 
them about racism, white supremacy. And I don't, I didn't download that program, but I listened to it, and I was trying to explain uh, or to share with Miss Ashley what I heard on that program. Could you, if you, as much as you remember, if if you could, could you share kind of uh, what you experienced when you called in, why you called in, what you were trying to ask, and what happened to you when you called the show? <laughs> oh boy. So actually, no, you know what? I actually, I wish I download that program because me too. Um, I no, I I do remember some of it, but I I I wish I had downloaded it because um, I really wanted to see the difference between the time that I was really, I really felt like I was angry, mm-hmm. <laughs> till till now where I'm getting a little bit more reserved because I'm starting to see things a little bit more clearly and and starting to try to change the way I behave about certain things. So. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the time that I did that, I, was, I wouldn't say I was, I shouldn't say I was angry because I wasn't even really angry then, but I think I was just sort of frustrated because I'm hearing all these women and they're talking in a certain way around this, this white guy and um, making him feel like he was so special when, you know, it's not very hard to be special. I mean, really the whole point of what I was trying to make was that, well, it's not very hard for Mr. Stone to be considered such a special guy among black women because, you know, a lot of black men didn't ha- weren't in the same position as he is financially and status-wise. I mean, we all know that. In the system of racism and white supremacy, of course he's going to be able to do all those things for you. So why are you trying to make him seem like he's more special than he is? Because he's not. And I was trying to get that across to them, and instead they, they, just, they said, you know, well, you're, you know, what was I, I can't even remember what the comments were, but they essentially went like, you know, well, you know, I don't have I don't have the time or the patience to wait for a black man to come along that's gonna sweep me off my feet or whatever the case may be, whatever their issues were. And I, you know, to me it just it was just frustrating because I I just it's just hard to understand how as black women I see a lot of black women in, in my life that have the patience to go through school to go get their undergrad degree, to get their master's degree, to even get their doctorate degree. You know, you have enough patience to do that, but you don't have enough patience to try to work with other black men, to try to mend, to try to mend the fences, try to work with each other, and try to clean up our relationships to the point where you would, wouldn't mind being with a black man. You see what I'm saying? Mm. And so that's sort of like what I was getting to. And instead they were sort of like, well, you know, well, you know, what is, this has nothing, you know, why are you calling us up about this? And this is, that's a, you know, this has nothing to do with racism. And, and we'll, you know, and like a lot of people make that mistake of saying, oh, well, you know, this will probably make things better because I'm with a white person. As, as a non-white person, I'm with a white person. So it's going to maybe get rid of racism. Well, then I made the comment that, well, it didn't help with Strahd Thurman. It didn't help with George Washington. It didn't help with Thomas Jefferson. So you tell me, when is it going to start helping? I think I kind of made a comment towards that, and then they sort of like, you know, kind of shut me up. I think I got shut down at that point. I don't think they let me keep talking on there, and they just kind of shut me down. And then the interesting thing about it is that whenever I said anything, it was usually the black women that came at me instead of the one white guy that was in the whole entire program that came at me. And when he did say something, he actually agreed with me most of the time. What, that's what was so funny. So I said, now this guy, he's agreeing with me, but you're not arguing with him about him agreeing with me. I mean, why didn't they come at him and say, wait a second, Mike, why are you going along with what she's saying? That, I didn't hear any of that. Mm. But every time I had something to say, it was like, let's laugh at her, let's laugh at what she has to say because she doesn't know what she's talking about. That's sort, of mm. like the, that's sort of the sense of what I got when I called her. And I, I guess I shouldn't call it anger. I should just say it's frustration because, you know. That's really what it was. It was just frustration. But now I know better because, you know, I'm learning a lot from your show. I learned a lot from Mr. Williams. I learned a lot from Mr. Fuller, Dr. Wellesley, you know, all, all you guys in the counter-racism movement. So I learned a lot over the last, ever since that happened. And I've gotten to the point where now I kind of understand where that comes from. So, you know, I don't get as frustrated too much because I know where it's coming from, you know? Hmm. I, I wish I had downloaded that program. I got the first time when he was on her show. I got that one, but I did not get the next. The second one I didn't want because that one I just felt was really pornographic, but the third one I wish I had <laughs> grabbed that one. Um, that I, I, 
that was the exact thing that I felt really highlighted that program. I felt the non-white females really attacked and ridiculed you, and the white Mike Stone really wasn't doing that. He was just kind of sitting back and, and letting these uh, non-white females who were uh, kind of putting him up on a pedestal uh, just, you know, attack and, and ridicule the things that you were saying. Miss um, Ashley, she asked me, do you remember if Mike Stone or the non-white females on the call, do you remember if they agreed that we are in a system of white supremacy? Uh, I don't think any of them ever mentioned that. All I remember was Mike, as far as agreeing with anything I had to say, it was the one white guy in the room, you know, Mike Stone, who said, well, you know, the young lady has a, you know, she's making a, you know, she's making a few valid points. And I remember him saying that. And then that was pretty much it. I didn't, they didn't agree to any system of racism or anything like that. They were too busy, like, uh, you know, and, you know, the thing is is that when, when you know, just like anybody, and I real, I understand now where it came from because, you know, whenever you do anything wrong, nobody likes to make a mistake, Right. Mm. And when someone and then when someone points out that mistake or they point out and give you a little bit of doubt about what you do what you're doing or what you did, like as far as, you know, being with a white person, they you know, they get you know, they nobody wants to admit to making a mistake. Let's put it that way. Mm. So of course they of course they're going to of course they're going to like shun anything I have to say. And in some cases they didn't think they were making any mistake and they thought somebody was attacking them because they were questioning what they were doing. You know, but people are gonna you know I get questioned all the time. I'm, I'm a teacher. I get questioned all the time about things. And, you know, what you have to do is get, get to the point where even if it's something that you never thought of before, you say, hey, you know, I never thought of that before. You know, it's something I need to think about. It doesn't mean I'm going to stop doing what I'm doing. But if I think about it long enough and hard enough and I think it's something that I need to change, a behavior I need to change, then maybe I'll do that. And if I think long and hard enough and I don't think I need to change that behavior, then I don't change it. So, you know, and maybe... If I was thinking that way at the time, I probably would have said that. I said, well, you know, I'm just putting it out there. I'm just, I'm just putting a little bit of information out there just to, just to cast a little bit of doubt about all these so-called uh, interracial relationships. If, there, if interracial relationships are such a great thing, why haven't we seen the end of racism yet? Mm. You know? I probably should have put that question out there, and then maybe I would have gotten a different response. I doubt it, yeah. but... <laughs> I have a question. I have a question for the. I have a question for the young lady. Hello. Uh, for me. Yes. Sure. Yes. Uh, because yeah, you know, I can respect. I can respect what you're you're saying, and it makes a, it makes a lot of sense. Um, but I, I want to play the the opposite side of that um, that situation because, say for instance, for me, I have a lot of you know, uh, female friends who are you know in their own right they've they've managed to um, make their own way. Um, and they've been somewhat um, somewhat successful by this society standards, whatever you, however you want to uh, quantify that. But you know, what do you say to you know? Because unfortunately, the media plays a statistic over and over again that you know, 70% of, of black women are single, and then you play into the considerations the fact that there's so many what you consider quote unquote um, underqualified black men. And what do you say to those women, say for instance, who there is a there is a there is a this purport like for instance when you go to a college campus, I went to HBCU, and you see that there is probably I would say nine, ten to one black women to black men. So what, what do you say to those women just based on the numbers? I mean that's I mean that's a, we have to talk about the reality of just raw numbers. There's a lot of us that are in jail. There's a lot of us that are on drugs. There are a lot of us that are in um, that are not um, quote unquote productive in forms of um, being able to to take care of ourselves, much less um, be able to provide, protect, and prepare a family. So how, how do you how do you kind of deal with that as a as a black woman, knowing that? I don't know. If, I don't. I'm not really understanding. What you mean by how do I deal with that? No, I'm saying I'm talking about I'm talking about taking the opposite side of the coin, meaning that as if if you were in a situation like I like my friends that I know who they've gone on and they've got their their, their degrees, they've you know they they're making you know, they're making their own means, they're doing well, and they they like for instance I have some of them they they're not trying to go date a um 
a white person, but what, what is the answer to, to them when the numbers are just are not in their favor? What is the answer to that? What do you think the answer to that is? For them. I'm just, I guess my question is, how does that relate to what I mentioned earlier? Because I, I, I can, <coughs> excuse me, I understand what you mean by the numbers, but then I'm, see, I'm at a point now in my life where everything has to be suspect. You know, I, I kind of learned that from studying Mr. Fuller's book, that you have to really take everything as suspect. Now, I'm not saying that the numbers are wrong, that 10 to 1 or 9 to 1 is wrong, but I would have to actually do the statistics. No, no. Like, that's, that's the first thing. So I, no, no, I, no, I, no, I just, said on, I just said on a black college campus, I just said this, you know, what you see on a college campus sometimes is that there's a disproportionate amount of women to men. I'm not saying that there's necessarily as a whole, but I'm just giving an example like, what do you what do you say to the fact that there? I mean, it's we we can't deny that there is a fact that there is a lot more eligible black women than there are black men just from incarceration okay. and other factors. That's what I'm talking about. Okay, so my yeah, so that would be my next question to you is that what do you mean by eligible? I mean, I don't, I'm mean, still not understanding. Meaning, meaning single, meaning meaning single, meaning right. that they're not you know they're not married, they're not you know in a relationship that they are able to focus they're not on drugs, they're not constantly in trouble with the law. You know, I mean, that's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about someone who's necessarily got, who's rich beyond you. I'm just talking about someone who's, who's out there just making it day to day. That guy who's well, he's going, he's going to work, he's doing the right thing, not getting in any trouble. You know, how, how do you deal with the numbers aspect for a black woman? I I can't speak to the numbers. All I can speak to is the fact that, you know, I'm just looking at the looking at the big picture here. And the big picture here is, is that if we have enough patients to go through high school, go through our undergrad, to go get our masters, to go get a PhD, to go further in our careers. If we have the patients to work through that, then we need to learn to have learn to have enough patients to work with each other. Now, I think now I can't speak. Now I can't speak to the numbers. I I understand where you're coming from with that, and I really don't. I really don't even know how to even begin to deal with the match. I mean, I guess you're you're, you're concerned about matchups, like you know how are we able to get enough black women to match up with black men. I understand where you're coming from, okay. but um, I I'm I'm saying I'm just saying that that we need to start looking at the big picture for one. And yeah, the numbers are there, but we got to start looking at the big picture and saying that. If we can have enough patients to go through school and work through our careers and work up to that that all all lofty position in, in some corporate in some corporate ladder, if we're willing to do that and spend all those years doing that, we need to start spending a few years thinking of you know just, you know half of those years would be nice if we like fifteen or twenty years just trying to work towards how can we how can we form relationships with each other and not it and not it be about whether we match up economically with each other or match up physically with each other or match up all kinds of different ways with each other? In other words, we have to think about uh, I don't know how to put this I guess um, I guess i'm just i'm just I'm just looking I'm just trying to look at the big picture here. I'm not necessarily looking at the numbers and I understand where the numbers are coming from and and what are women are supposed to do and yet that's a very good question, and that all comes back to what you what you can do. You know what's gonna, what what you can do. Now you can you can go with a white person, but what is that going to do to your mind? So you got it. So there's all these little factors you have to think about. It's not just about finding someone to have kids with. It's not just about that. It's about whether you're you have the mindset and the mind is set in a way that is not going to mess you up even more because you do it, because you can't find some, you know, just because some other situation is this way, now you got to go to this situation, which is even worse for your, for your mind, your soul, your spirit. That's the way I look yeah. at it. Well, yeah, and, and that's the, and, and I know, um, you know, the, the whole thing, I don't know what your, your take on this is, but, like, see, I, I have, you know, I have the, the, I've been fortunate enough to be blessed with, you know, uh, a great deal of, uh, of female friends that I know from college that are, you know, they're doing well, and so, to, to comment on what the young lady just said, like for instance, I have a friend. She's in the military, and she's very she's one of the most decorated officers, regardless of pay grade. And she works on Congress, 
Um, she even was on TV recently. Um, and she, you know, and she makes a conscious effort because I, I, you know, I made sure that she understood she can't have this criteria because at one point she had the criteria that if she was on dates once, he had to be doing at least as well as she was. And I had to kind of break that down for her. I said, okay, you're making about $120,000 a year. The average person in this country doesn't make $120,000 a year. So you have to get beyond the money aspect of it. And then sometimes it boils down to, you know, they, they want a, a different experience. Now, when she, she did venture out, and I, and I encouraged her to, you know, if, if a guy comes to her in a respectful manner to give him a chance, and on several occasions she, she has done that. I mean, she's, you know, like there's a guy that's, you know, who was working at the airport with like a red cap or something or a bus driver. I told her, you know, don't, don't, don't limit yourself. And, and like I said, so what the you know, young lady said, you know, is, is very um, enlightening. I'm glad that she, she's, you know, she has that thought, that thought process behind um, behind that, but like you know, I know quite a few women who have um, who've tried to you know to open up their minds and broaden their horizons. Now, on the other side of that, and I'm just speaking from the male point of view, is that we have got to um, we have we we have got to step up our uh, our game in terms of you know when when you get an opportunity to meet someone. Um, who you know who who you know apparently has some type of substance they you know that that they've gone to school and everything we can't be talking about Lil Wayne all the time we can't be talking about um just just nonsense because the situations she she encountered were were like you know it wasn't surface they came off as being respectful but then as soon as they opened their mouths it was just just absolute other nonsense that came out their mouths and we have to have being respectful. Uh, 631, I wanted to, uh, I didn't want to take up all your time or all of our time. I had uh, one one final uh, request. Um, there was, I've had, I guess at this point, had several Asian people on the program uh, who have acknowledged that black people are treated worse than all of the non-white people in the system of white supremacy. And uh, you felt uh, it would be correct to ask uh, Asian people or just other non-black victims of white supremacy um, would they be willing to go on record and say that black people should not spend their money in uh, Asian uh, nail salons, beauty shops, that sort of thing? They should not do that uh, until was it until race uh, until the system of white supremacy has been replaced with a system of justice, or until uh, other non-black people have shown a commitment uh, to black people and a commitment to uh, countering white supremacy was was that the statement? Am I getting it correctly? Uh, the, yeah, I think it's the latter part. Like if they if they are committed to trying to make sure that we all um, have justice, I guess part of the reason why I was I I was hoping to maybe get um, I'm not trying to get them to admit to anything, but a, as you know, I mean if if they are in that community, whether it be Asian, Southeast Asian, what they call the Southeast Asian, uh, Latino, you know, in these communities, and they know that they have uh, customers or people who spend money at their businesses for whatever it is that they're spending their money on, yet they feel like it's okay for us to be, not I shouldn't say okay to be treated a certain way, but they go along with, us being treated a certain way. Let's put it that way. Um, being mistreated, I should say being mistreated. That's probably the best word. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think part of the reason why I brought that up is because I think that if we're going to try to work as non-white people, which includes everyone except white people, then we have to admit among ourselves. It's called being real with people. You have to, we have to admit among ourselves that this is going on among each other. I mean, the only way we're going to be able to get rid of the abuse is to call it out, right? Mm. So, like, you know, it, I, I would say the same thing if it, were, if it was black people doing it. If there's black people, out, black people out there abusing other non-white people because they know they can or they can take advantage of that, take advantage of them for some reason in a form of mistreatment, then I think that that needs to be called out. Mm. You know, when you're when you're feeding when you're feeding our children and and our parents and our grandparents food that you know is no good for them because it has MSG in it, but you don't care because you know 
you're not eating the food, all you're doing is eating the white rice, then I got a problem with that. You know, when you're selling this stuff in the beauty store, and uh, and this may not be happening for long after Chris Rock's good hair, mm. now that these white people know that they can make money off us with this stuff, there's a good chance that those those beauty supply stores that are all run by so-called Asians are going to turn over to white people. That's my guess. Okay, that's my prediction. And see, this is what I was, this is what I was trying to get back to before is that you know we got to realize that. And, you know, and if you go, if you go into a 7-Eleven, don't try to cheat me out of money because you think you can, because you think I'm not paying attention, or you think that I can't count, or I can't read. You're going to take advantage of that. See, we, we, see, we all have to start recognizing when among ourselves that this is what's happening. And like you said, we're the ones on, we're, black people are probably the one. I mean, well, I shouldn't say probably. We are the lowest ones on the totem pole when it comes to being victims of racism, white supremacy. And the last thing we need is other systems of racism, and white supremacy who are not black to come along and reign our parade too. That's, you know, and I think that if you're going to call yourself being part of this movement and you're not black, then one of the things you need to start admitting is that among your own community they are, they are, they are mistreating people who they think they can mistreat, which is black people. That's, that's all I'm saying. And I know a lot of people say, oh, well, a lot of us can't even afford to go into these places. I said, well, you could have fooled me because I can walk into any Chinese restaurant right now <laughs> around the block and find black people in there. So don't tell me that, uh, you know, don't tell me that uh, we can't afford to go into these places. I, you go into a beauty supply store, there's not a whole lot of white people in there buying those beauty supplies women in there buying their weaves and wigs and all that stuff, okay? Mm. So that's, this, this is, these are some of the things that we need to start to talk about among each but not really talk about really because it's not really up for discussion because I don't really think we need to discuss this. We don't need to be arguing over, over these things. It just has to be an acknowledgement from other people and other communities that, hey, these people are, are mistreating you and at least admit, admit to that. If you're really, truly interested in justice, tell us about these things. Tell us that they are, are mistreating us. Tell us, tell us that, yes, they, you know, you know we, we, we put something in their nails so that they'll keep coming back for more. Who knows what, what those chemicals are that they're putting in those nail salons? We, we, you know, that's why they're covering their faces with masks, not because they're there all day. It's because there's something in that stuff. So you shouldn't even be in there for more than five minutes in those nail salons. Okay, so you know it's just things like that. I just I you know I guess I can come up with a lot of different things. Maybe I'll just sit down and write it down one day and just send it to you. And you could you know with your nice voice and everything, you could. Tell me. <laughs> I don't have to say a thing. I won't say a thing. I'll just send it to you. But uh, <laughs> right on. Simply, you have my you have my email address. Uh, when you get it down, send it out. Although uh, Miss Ashley said the same thing. Uh, we should not be copping out to that. Uh, they might, white people could come kill back uh, Gus today easily. So you have a voice. You should be using it. Uh, same thing for you, Miss Ashley. Um, before we uh, close out, 50th program for the cows. Again, no celebration, but 50 programs. Hey, um, if you all have a final comment that you would like to uh, express before we wrap things up, Miss Ashley, 720, uh, we have a lot of people still online, uh, 631 and uh, 980. If you all have final questions, comments you would like to get out before we wrap things up, please go ahead. Yeah, actually, oh, go ahead. No, I, I was just going to say I have no comments. I think I said enough. Miss <laughs> Ashley? She's still there. 720, do you have a final question, comment? A final comment. Uh, thank you for the show, Renegade. Thank you for tuning in. I appreciate the uh, consistent support, Mr. 720. Uh, and I contacted uh, Professor Lair, and he said he was down to come on the show, but we were trying to get a date, and uh, we have stalled on the date. But he said he was willing to come, waiting on a date. So I'll let you know when that pans out. Um, Justice, did you have uh, anything you wanted to say before we uh, close things out? Oh, 
Hello? Yes, ma'am. Oh. Um, I don't have anything to say. Okie dokie. You want to give them the email address one more time? Yes. Justice.asap at yahoo.com. Outstanding. Uh, just, just wanted to say, uh, I'm sorry, victim um, of racism. I just wanted to say if I did any cursing, because I forgot you were on the show. <laughs> I forgot I forgot you were there. So if I had did it, if I said anything or if I cursed or anything, I don't know if I did. Just excuse that. I'll do better in the future. Thank you. I don't remember uh, you doing so, so I think you were okay. Um, okay. We will be back. Um, we have a show scheduled for Sunday, uh, Dr. Nancy Krieger. This is uh, this is Dorothy Roberts, actually, from August, still paying dividends. Dorothy Roberts suggested uh, Vernelia Randall, who was on the program at the end of August. She also suggested Dr. Nancy Krieger. She is a white woman. Uh, she is a doctor at Harvard. Uh, Dorothy Roberts says she has done the most and best research on how racism impacts the health of non-white people. She will be here uh, on Sunday at 4 p.m. Eastern, 1 p.m. Pacific, and uh, 3 p.m. Central, Lauren Ashley. Um, that should be very interesting. I'm looking forward to having her on the show. Uh, however, there might be a show for uh, the day commonly recognized as Halloween. I'm not sure yet. Um, waiting for a few things to pan out. Um, if the show goes down, it'll be a great show to end the month on if it goes down. If not, we'll be here Sunday, no big deal. But uh, there looks like a strong possibility there will be a show uh, on Saturday at uh, 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 p.m. Pacific, uh, 1 p.m. Central. So just uh, subscribe, uh, favorite the show, subscribe, and uh, keep checking back to see if it goes down. Uh, please check the blog, racism-notes.blogspot.com. Uh, you can shoot me an email, uh, my email address, untiljustice at gmail.com, untiljustice at gmail.com. And uh, since we're doing the 50th program of the cows, I did want to say uh, most of these programs, uh, we've had white people, and not just white people off the street, most of these programs, we've had white people who've had a Ph.D., uh, authors, professors at major institutions across this country and across the world. We've had people here from Cambridge as well. Um, I think, even though I'm ignorant and even though I am a victim of racism, white supremacy, I think Justice and I have held our own talking to these white people. By and large, we have held our own. Uh, I think if you listen to these shows, you either have to conclude Justice and I are absolute geniuses if we've been able to hold our own with these white people who most of them make their living talking about racism, writing books, doing talks, teaching at colleges and universities across the world. If we can hold our own with these white people, either we are geniuses, racism, white supremacy is not that complicated, or both. Got to be one of those three, because I don't think any of the white people who have come on this show or non-white people, and made us sound like idiots. I think we have done an excellent job holding our own thus far. Uh, personally, I don't think racism, white supremacy is that complicated. Do a little studying. Do a little research. Be careful with your words. I don't think it's that complicated. I think a lot of white people make it much more complicated than it needs to be to continue to confuse non-white people. It's not that complicated. Once you simplify things, you can talk to any white person anywhere on the planet and start to make sense of what's going on real easy. Hopefully we'll continue to do that. Thank you all for tuning in to the program. We will be in touch. Uh, check Lauren Ashley's site for the wonderful T-shirts that she just came up with. They're great. Check the blog, and uh, please email justice, justice.asap at yahoo.com. Hopefully we will be back uh, perhaps next Saturday to share more constructive information on racism, white supremacy, and how to replace white supremacy with a system of justice immediately. Uh, we will be back, Gus and Justice, signing off for the cows.